G'day, everyone. For those who came in late, you're listening to X Men, the Phantom Podcast. 500 years ago, he washed ashore the sole survivor of a shipwreck. And upon the skull of the man who killed his dad, he said, I'm mad, I must eradicate piracy, injustice, and cruelty. And all my sons will follow me, so evildoers will believe that this man cannot die. The Phantom! The ghost who walks! The Phantom! Enemies beware! The there, but you won't Hello, we are the Chronicle Chamber team and this is x the Phantom Podcast, episode 212 comics for January and I guess December of 2021. Um, our website is chroniclechamber.com. You can contact us via email, chroniclechamber at gmail.com. Of course, you can either subscribe to us through uh, whatever, however you're engaging with us now, whether that's YouTube or your favourite podcast app, including um, iTunes or Spotify. First time we've done a comics review for a couple of months with the the silly season and uh, the the start of the new year and all that sort of stuff getting on top of us a little bit personally. But for the first time uh, in 2022, since our Best of 21 podcast, team's back together again to talk about the comics, fan comics around the world. Um, It's good to see you guys. How are you? Uh, How are you, Steve? We'll start with you. I'm very well, Dan. I'm, I'm happy to be here, even if it's only for a little bit. (laughs) <laughs> yes, I know we're starting to record it later into the evening and you're not going to be able to stay forever. Um, and there's also issues with the uh, with the annual, which I'm sure we'll mention. But uh, good to have you for now, at least. And uh, Germ, um, welcome welcome back to the podcast. Happy to talk some stories today. Yeah, it's been a while. We're just going to have some fun because let's face it, unfortunately, many of us are still um, uh, facing uncertainties, uh, sicknesses, and, and even COVID. Um so, you know, it's, it's hitting home still for a lot of people. So let's have some fun. Uh, and hopefully you, our listeners, whether you're on YouTube or whether you're on audio, um, you have some fun as well listening to, uh, you know, three Muppets talk about the Phantom. You mentioned certainty, Jim. One thing you can be certain of, even in uh, in this day and age, the whole way through the last 85 plus years, is that there will be a daily phantom strip appearing in your newspaper or uh, Comics Kingdom these days. We're going to mix things up a little bit. We want to talk about the daily and the Sunday stories first up. Um, if we start with the Sundays, we're still, since last time we spoke, I think the uh, the Injuns, that story, had only just sort of started last time we recorded one of these at the beginning of December. So we've got a couple of months now, eight or, or maybe 12 um, ep- um, pages uh, into the Sunday, and it's basically the story of the two Maori girls who have uh, gone into Mauatan and the Phantom starting to track them down. And where we've caught up with the girls is uh, as they are, uh, um, have gone into the city. They've found themselves in an art gallery. They're also starting to draw the eye of some nefarious um, roughnecks who who have their own ideas about what they might be able to do with a couple of innocent uh, jungle girls who have found their way into the city. What are you thinking of this story so far, guys? I don't know. It feels like we're about two thirds of the way through, maybe. Yeah, I will admit I'm still on the fence. Like it's just it, it, it seems to be a bit of a long build up or a longer build-up. I've enjoyed kind of like the many threads coming in, like you've had the the Mori, um, uh, what do you call it, when they go on the um, on the cruise on the boat. So, you know, with uh, the voyaging canoe, that's it, the voyaging. So, you know, we've had that thread come in, which was a past story of Tony Poor. We've uh, got, you know, uh, Heloise and Cardia, who I still believe will be, the 22nd Phantom's uh, wife or Kit's wife. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of threads kind of coming together, but this ab- actual story, I don't know. It's still it's still being set up, I think. So, yeah, I'm not really sure what to think of it yet. It's been interesting. Like, the well, at the start, it was really about the these uh, young ladies. Uh, where are their names again? I'm just trying to remember. Navo and uh, Adani, Adani could be. Um, they were really disappointed that they weren't able to compete with the men, and so they really wanted to be yeah. strong and, and prove that they can make it in the in the world, um, and mix it with the men. And now they've moved in, on in into the city, into into Maritan, and where they're going to meet with things that they never had to deal with. And if you're watching this, you'll just have just seen some of the bad guys there who are, well, without much of a spoiler, they want to put them into the slave trade, basically, is where the 
going to go with this. Um, now, there has been some comments, you know, when you read the peanut gallery on Comics Kingdom saying, oh, here come a couple of girls and the fans going to have to rescue them. I trust Tony to pull a fair bit and I reckon that he's going to have a few aces up his sleeve and it, the fandom might help them and guide them a bit on, on their way, but we're going to see some, some real women power as this goes through. I think that's been evident in stories with Heloise. I think it's going to be mm. evident in this story as well. And in the end... Um, hopefully um, the Maury will, will see this. And I think the, the, the Maury King or Maury Prince, um, he, was in, he, was be, he was stuck between a rock and a hard, hard place at the time. He really wanted to help these girls out, but tradition was um, pushing down on him. Now, the, the dealer or the, the, the slave trader, the fellow in the white jacket, he's um, had a bit of a comeuppance in, um, in the Sunday panel from the 6th of February. Um, I don't know if we got that one up on screen at all, but um, he's met with the Phantom because uh, he would seem to be talking about, oh, you know, how much would you like for these guys? You know, imagine getting, you know, a room with these these two young ladies. Then, uh, well, well you, as you might have guessed, the Phantom didn't take to that too kindly. And um, he might be the, the drug, oh, I keep calling him a drug dealer, but the slave dealer might uh, be looking kind of confident in this panel but he's not too confident a little bit later on in a couple of weeks' time if, if we get that coming up. So um, I'm look, the fan is like just keeping an eye on them, allowing them to have their own, find themselves in, in the big city. Um, but I reckon like any parent would worry when their children, you know, go off into the big city. Um, and it's nice to know that there's someone looking out for them. You raise... I think you might be correct that it might the fans might spend this whole adventure kind of in the background and let these um uh let these two young ladies kind of be the the heroes of this story i remember the jungle patrol story with um kaya and i can't remember the other one where basically they became uh jungle patrol women um but it was a similar type of thing where the phantom kind of was really in the shadows and let them uh, you know, shine. And so, yeah, I reckon you might be right. This is, in a sense, their own voyaging uh, experience. Their own voyage, yeah. Yeah, their own voyage. Uh, you know, the men are on the canoe. These young girls are, are proving that they are strong and independent and uh, are women as well. So, yeah, you raise a good point there, Stephen. I reckon you might be on to something. So, now, I don't have daughters. Both of you guys do. And, Dan, you've you actually got older daughters. Is this ringing true for you? Are you feeling, how are you feeling about this? Oh, I hope that when my daughters go out in the world, and they're not far off it, um, they're probably a little uh, going with eyes a little bit more wide open than the Maury girls do, but that's fair enough. We're not coming from the deep woods. Um, <laughs> so we're a remote jungle tribe. Um, it's interesting. I've just... I've just I think Queensland's pretty similar. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Uh, you uh, said deep woods, not backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, keep going. <laughs> yeah, all good. Um, while you guys were talking, I just thought, oh, look at that. I bet you, Tony, you, you're right. Tony DePaul has got his head screwed on. Uh, went and had a look at what um, In Dunes meant, uh, the, the title of the story. Um, it, I, it, Google would say that I need to pronounce it Azunus um, <laughs> or somehow. So I'm not sure how you get that. It must be French or something. Um, but the, it, it, the definition of it is an innocent or unsophisticated young woman, especially in a play or film. So um, obviously, Tony, uh, the, the girls are, there's no doubt they're the centre of the story and, and whatever's happening with the Voyager canoe and that sort of thing belongs in a different story. Uh, with the focus here is on the girls. But you're right, Steve, just uh, just the, the Sunday most recent was um, fandom picking on a roughneck behind play in the shadows um, mm -hmm. as the girls move on unbeknownst to what's going on behind them. So, yeah, it could, it could be one of those stories. And that's okay too because it's, uh, it's good character to development for the others. And this story is a real uh, opportunity for not just character development but I guess character of the girls but character of the Maury's as a tribe mm. because um, Jeff Weigel has, has got a bit of licence here and he and Tony DePaul are working closely together to, to flesh out what is unique about the Maori tribe and their culture, and we're seeing that in the in the dress that the girls are wearing and uh, and the way that they're talking about traditions and that sort of thing. Uh, and I'm really I'm really enjoying that aspect of the story as much as anything else. It's been one of the yeah. best things that have happened in recent times. 
the, mm. the not just a tribe from this area or a tribe from this area. They are the absolute unique yes. people. And that has not happened in the past eighty years. No, um, it's I'm doing a lot of I'm doing a lot of research on this stuff stuff at the moment for a project that we're working on, and all of the like the identifying marks and and stuff like that. You know, ninety percent of what I'm finding on what makes Maori tribe unique and all that has come in the last five years. Same Apart as the, from just being fishermen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they all look the same. You know, same as uh, the Longo uh, as well. That was another one that um, uh, Mike Manley has made all the Longo wearing, I can't pronounce it, but basically all the Longo guys wear these long kind of, it's, for lack of a better word, a skirt, but it's like an African attire type of skirt and stuff like that as well. Um, hmm. Where, you know, the previous 80 years, they are all, you know, they're all cookie cutter, which, um, yeah, so, and Tony's done a great job in, in, in building secondary uh, characters as well. Yeah, look, that's it. We knew the Wambizi were into cattle. We knew the Maori were into fishermen and they fed the the big cats on the on Eden. But other than that, they didn't really have their own identity and it's really good to see that being fleshed out. Yeah. Yeah. And there's been a bit of reality brought, brought into the strip here. Some like they're in the art gallery, but those are actually real um, artworks that were that were there that we saw a moment ago. Yeah, I think that's really cool. And um, in uh, one of the comments on Facebook, Jeff Weigel mentions that they've come from, um, and he quoted the artist. And I should know the name, um, but who's also doing a lot of work on David uh, Riddick. Yeah, and and what was the comic strip that he works on? Um, oh. Yeah, he's another comic strip artist. I can't remember the top of my head. Yeah, but just um, and and I love that he's got these real artworks in in the gallery, and the girls are still looking at him, going, "Yeah, I don't really get it." So <laughs> I must admit, I'm kind of with him on that one. <laughs> I think in in um in the latest one they were talking, yeah, it, art's good, but uh, isn't that supposed to be useful, like on our shields and clothing yeah. and stuff? What's it doing in a gallery? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, no, so it's really good. So that, that story is continuing to to move along. Um, it's one of those ones, so I hear what you're saying, Jim, about it being a bit slow-paced. It's one of those ones that maybe when you see it in a comic book and you're not reading it once a week, it, it will flow a little bit better. So um, we'll just have to wait and see how that yeah. comes. And I think there's a little bit of a it's, – it's a fairly – there's been a lot of discussion about that. Um, I think, and we've said it a few times, I understand where they're coming from in the sense that it can be hard reading one strip a day or one strip a week and being enthused about the story. But a lot of these people were never following the strips or stories that they love now. You know, all the Cy Barrier stories, all the Lee Fort stories that they're hailing as classics and all that. A lot of the people that are commenting about that, they don't like it. They've only ever read those stories as actual comics mm. which there's and we've discussed it on podcasts before and we'll discuss it again with some of the story, through stories which we're going to be reading uh, or some of the stories printed in through that we'll be reading soon is we've never read those stories we've only ever read those stories as a comic we've never read them as an actual strip we're only reading these stories now as a strip so I, I think there's it's easy to be a critic, but I think there needs to be a little bit of perspective and, um, uh, you know, people just, yeah. There's, I, I, I get where they're coming from, but I think they need to realise that this is how people have been doing it for 85 years. Um, you know, it, obviously it's working. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. I 100% agree with what you're saying there. So um, if we if we march on to the dailies, um, it. We do have two stories to talk about, but really they're still one part of the one continuity. And I'm I'm starting to see that this um, this tale that's unfolding at the moment. I think we're now in. Is it? Are we now into the third story that sort of has all? Yeah. Because through December we were having the Chronicle of Old Man Moz, and then other than having a a, a a panel that said, right, we're starting a new story. This one's called Death in the Himalayas. It's been seamless. So it's a little bit like the death of Diana Palmer saga, I think, in that regard, in that we're, yeah. we're seeing quite a long extended narrative, perhaps broken into chapters, um, and, we're, and we're into the next chapter now. Um, so the Chronicle of Old Man Moz, we know that that has been um, Moz 
telling the story to the fandom about what he sees is the likely consequences if he goes and saves Savannah from um, her prison in um, uh, grave not, lines. Not the likely it will happen. Yeah, so this is what's going to happen. He's, he's telling the... He's, we're seeing the true future and saying, look, Phantom, this is what's going to happen if you go and follow through on your plan to, to rescue Savannah from Gravelines prison. And um, then I guess the difference is, well, uh, maybe I'm confused here, but in now it, with Death in the Himalayas, are we assuming this is no longer the story, is it? This is actually now what has happened because the Phantom, the right, I don't care, and he did go and rescued Savannah. Uh, this, is still, this is still... The story. This is still old man, old man mods talking, or you know, writing things down. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it is. Let's, let's, we'll just kind of go through the chronicle of old man mods. So this, um, so this is what we're showing at the moment, where basically, yes, the phantom doesn't die by that bullet, um, but then he. I'm not, I'm not happy with Savannah sharing the bed with the phantom. I know nothing. Hanky well, he's unconscious. Happened. He's but, it's certainly um, it hasn't stopped women before. They're recovering in a coma. Yeah, it hasn't stopped women before. There's a huge story um, of... Uh, so we've got a better author on this one. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so it basically has a fever. One thing I do like, and I'll just go back to this here, is there's been some feedback on the podcast uh, with ourselves, but also uh, with some of the guests that we had, is that they've... Mike Manley has signposted... The, the the flashbacks or the the present time the story a little bit better in some of these panels which there's a little bit of sign better signposting so I'm kind of I'm happy with that so this is where yeah I don't think um, it's better I think it's the same thing he was just doing it's just people have realised it now yeah it might have been but there wasn't any of those bubbles or anything like that before. yeah they were I picked that, that it remember yeah. Maybe they're more accentuated and people are looking for them now. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so he had a fever. Um, uh, there was a panel, this one here, which one was it? On the 25th. This one here. I, I enjoyed this little bit here where it says, say exactly what kind of man are you, Walker? This is on the 25th of December. You just can't seem to die. And then, you know, the fans just goes, that's just some story that's been going around. So, you know, there's a bit of fun involved there. I just enjoy that story, um, that little bit. Um, so, yeah, anything else that you wanted to kind of raise about this bit? About this actual little bit? No, we're, we're, I think we're pretty cool with, with all this. So I think it ends with um, uh, the Phantom travelling off to the Himalayas there, or I th yeah. this is still so on the that's story. It. Yeah. That's it there. Yeah. And then this is back to yeah. So we think that the fan now. What's interesting in Wait, can you go to the... sorry, the the one where Savannah's on the train. Oh yeah, I think that's the next one. That's it there. Yeah, yeah. So this is yeah. back to old man Miles story. story. Yeah. Now I can't remember which one, if, whether it's in the Chronicle of Old Man Miles or whether it's in Death in the Himalayas, but there's a, a certain thing that Old Man Miles says, and it's not that the Phantom line is ended, but it's the walker line of phantoms is ended, or the walker. So mm. it's not to, yeah, so that's an interesting. I think with this, you raise a good point. There has to be, you have to, like, uh, Dan, you said it before that uh, Tony chooses his words wisely. And when, you know, he didn't say that the walker line, or the phantom line is better, it's the walker line. So there's, you're right, Stephen, I think, He's used those words for... He walks a very fine line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And most people just miss it. Um, I think the, the, the tricky thing with this um, telling the story, is it old Moz telling the story and therefore it's the predicted future or is this actually happening right now? That's probably more difficult to follow in, a, in the daily because there's not the, the indication every single day which side of the narrative this is. So we see the, the example here on the screen, which is the, the date of the, the 21st of January. We've got old Moz and that's in the square box for the panel. And then he's, you know, telling the story, which is in the clouded box for the panel, which Steve's right, has, has been happening all along in this narrative. But if you missed this day and tuned in because life, 
and then you yeah. come in, you don't know whether, you know, that's where the challenge is. Maybe if there was on it every day, you could see this was a clouded <laughs> one. It might be easier to, for people to follow. That, and and, and may, maybe that's just me. Um, because there again, you know, here we have on the, the 24th, this is on <laughs> this the is left. Flashback in a more of a story, having a flashback <laughs> of when and using that same technique. So it gets a bit. You can see why people might get confused <laughs> with this one on a daily basis. And well, he, once again, he 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 was in a bit of a corner. He wants to show the death of the Phantom, but that, but not actually make the Phantom die yeah. and um, try and please everybody. And so it's tricky. And um, we appreciate like- that. We realise it's hard. And um, for those of us who really don't want to see the Phantom die, we're quite happy with a what if <laughs> scenario and we're willing to go along with this what if scenario. <laughs> we're actually really looking forward to what's going to happen. Well, by the time this podcast is released, uh, what's just happened in the past week. Yeah. Um, because it's really, really at a crucial point now. We've got um, Savannah in, in the pub or, pub or restaurant or cafe uh, with, with Kit. And. Um, they're about to meet the, the, the police officer, I believe. Who, uh, what's his name? Jampa yeah. or Wampa? Jampa, yeah. Uh, Jampa, I was right first time. And um, something wrong is going to happen. This, I'm really excited to see what's happening mm. this week. And, um, yeah, Savannah's going to screw everything up. I can just feel it in my bones. Yes. yes. So a couple of things. I really like, this is interesting here how Kid admitted that he had a crush on her. Um, in another flashback, that yeah. <laughs> really, really uh, you see how much, you, how much time channel. has passed between the death of Diana series and and now that he's yeah, really true. like he's, he's become a man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this panel here was actually edited. Um, I knew you were going to put this up. You you were keen to hear about this one, Jermaine. Oh, I, where I, was I the editing done? Um, <laughs> yeah, in the shower scene, of course. Now I understand why it was edited. Um, but I, I find things like that interesting. I like hearing, you know, behind the scenes and uh, and stuff like that. And more, you know. Um, mm. So yeah, that was, it was it was just interesting. Uh, so this was on the thirty first of uh, January. So I was yeah, about a week ago by the time you listened to that. And uh, if you go and look at Mike Manley's Facebook page, he actually shows you the the unedited panel, which does show a little bit of underboob on Savannah in the shower. That was uh, didn't pass the muster of the editors, and Mike had to put some bubbles across the top, um, which didn't look at all um, odd when you saw it live. Um, but then when you see the the original, you go, oh yeah, okay, I can see, I can see how that's been edited. Yeah. So yeah, that's yeah. really interesting stuff. It actually took me a couple of goes to figure out what's been edited. Oh, <laughs> there it is. Uh, it really had me stuff. Which, but also now poses the question: When Frub will publish this um, story, will they have the edited version, or will they go? Completely no, edited. Edited. They'll just go from what was published on Comics Kingdom, I'm sure. Yeah, they, basically they'll get it from uh, King Features. Um, so I, I enjoyed this panel here. Just uh, This is on the... Oh, where's the date gone? 28th. Um, 28th. Yeah, 28th. Sorry, I can't see that on my Zoom screen. Uh, where you've got the, the mother giving Kit the just the disgusted look like, stop chatting up my daughter. Uh, it's just, you know... As, as a father of, of daughters and all that, you know, it's just, it's, it's just those little things that uh, Tony and Mike and Jeff that are putting in the stories, just that little bit of care and the, just, you know, th- there's so many of those little things and care that they put in that a lot of fans miss. But that's, then, a, that's a sense of realism. Hmm. Yeah, 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 exactly. And a lot of other fans are going to look at it and go, oh, I like that. Or, you know, and <clears throat> it's just, yeah. <clears throat> I just really liked it. I lo- and then the other panel. Yeah, one? I like that one. Go, scroll back to that one. Uh, that one? Ah, look at that. Where the kid's walking out in the shadows of the phantom. Yeah, on the 26th of, of January. That I thought that was a really nice touch as well. Mm. And we've, we've seen the artists do that, not just um, Mike, but Jeff's done that sort of um, shadowing before. Where, yeah, and he um, tends to do it like the, the thought processes of... of um, kit there are all about you know his history and his heritage and who the phantom is and those are the moments when he has the the shadow of the phantom with him at all times mm. Mm. the other one i like is on the 25th of, the, of january where kit flags the idea of 
why I can't dad, i.e. the 21st Phantom, be the first Phantom to, to have a good run and basically being able to retire. From... I really like that too. I thought that was an interesting thing to, to put in. Be the so, first Phantom to actually meet his he won't be the first because Julie Walker retired. <laughs> She's the only phantom to have died of old age. She's not a number. She's not a numbered phantom. No, she's not a she's not a number. She's uh what seventeen point two or or five. Uh, if you but yeah, no, I, I just love that panel there where and I, I reckon Tony and again Tony doesn't do things by accident. He's probably put that out of there of like, hey, let's you know let's float the idea of basically the twenty first phantom being the first one to retire and um yeah. Yeah, it's it's a great thought. I'm, I'm actually going to show. I'm actually, I'm going to put this up as a as a social on social media and and get some uh, some support <laughs> from some of the other fans. Is just hey, do you like the idea of basically a, a phantom retiring, hanging up the hood or the cow? So so you know, so to speak. I think so, um, yeah. I think this this scene um, also speaks volumes for Kit Junior's mindset. He's putting himself in the position of. You know what? I think I'm ready. I'm starting to be the man yeah. who is the, the one for the job now. Um, well, you see here, he's he's starting to journal already. Yep. Um, and then there's another one. There was another thing. Oh, he really is preparing another... to leave the Himalayas. He is. Yeah, yeah. But this was, is still um... in the flashbacks, or still in the. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. This is still in the Moz story. Which so all of this yeah, is still, still be happening, but it's <laughs> and then this panel again, he's talking about this. So this is on the twenty sixth of January, the same one we were talking about before. At least Guren hasn't turned up at the door. That's a good sign. You know, if something happens, I would know when Guren finds out. So you're right. He's thinking about um, you know, that he yeah, you're right, he's ready to He's ready to become the next Phantom. So, um, yeah, no, really, I'm enjoying. It. I'm enjoying it more as I, if I just, again, I enjoy this more if I read it a couple of panels at a time. But if I'm just reading a panel a day, and it's just on Facebook, I tend to just kind of stroll through it. But I go back and reread all of these again when I do the podcast, and it's just like, oh. I miss this. Oh, this here, that's awesome. Oh, I like how Tony's done that and stuff like that as well. So I reckon for, for some people who can't handle snippets at a, at a day, I think it might, I think you might get a lot more enjoyment out of this if you read maybe, you know, read it once a week or something like that. And for those of us who have got longer attention spans, the drip feeding is nice. We can still deal with it. I like it. Please keep <laughs> the Phantom in our papers. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. We have to. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Um, so we've probably talked about the dailies and the, just the newspaper strip longer than I thought we were going to. But, look, that's where we're up to at the moment. Um, can't wait to see uh, where both the Sunday and the daily launch to next. All right. Let's um, launch into the comic world now because we know we've got a lot of comics to review. There's 12 comics across four continents um, that have come out since last time we recorded one of these. Um, and, of course, the Sundays and Dailies, which we've started. Now, um, we're going to start in Australia. We do have reviews from all over the world, so don't think you're going to have to listen to us uh, talk about all of those uh, 12 comics and 34 stories. Um, we, we've got some uh, fantastic people, Mikel and Ankit, who are going to do those reviews for us from around the globe. But we'll start in Australia because that is, um, that is where we are and those are the comics we've got. And, and uh, Steve, you have had a chance to read the, the Christmas uh, comic, haven't you? I, I did read it. It's been a, a while now. Um, but I, well, I'll, I'll just say a couple of things and then, I, then I'll leave because um, cool. I, I don't want to um, stay too much for the, for the comics review because as we, we've been mentioning COVID and lockdowns, I've only just received um, a bunch of my comics just like a couple of days ago. I've only just opened up the annual. I've looked at the cover and I've kind of I've read one story. So I don't want to be spoiled um, by the reviews and you guys have to watch out for spoilers. So I'm going to cut out in just a moment. However, a couple of thoughts just from what I've seen. I love the cover of, of the Christmas issue. I thought that was great. Phantom with, um, with Santa, I think, was brilliant. Um, 
of course, the stories, pretty much all the stories are, are from the um, from the newspaper, so we know that they're, they're great. And um, what was the last one? Lifeblood. Um, I can't remember Dylan, that. Dylan Rankin and Jeremy McPherson one. Yeah. It's, it was just a little short little four was six a little page short story. One. And I, I guess it's it, it polls very well in our best of three story. Uh, it was in the top ten from memory. Um, I you know, it, it, it was just a standalone story. It was fun, it was quick, uh, there was beautiful artwork, uh, it's good colouring and stuff like that. I wouldn't be surprised if we see a little bit more of this uh, in free uh, 2022 and 23 of basically newer or I don't want to say unestablished, unestablished phantom creators uh, kind of giving you, being giving it a go and, and creating short stories like that. I, I thought it was great. Um, you know, if you do, if you have, you know, Gaslight, Vietnam, a couple of these other ones. Uh, you've still got all the stuff from uh, Phantom Men, Phantom Men Kids and some of these other Phantom Men World uh, stories that hasn't been published as well. There's enough to be able to have some good quality backup stories in a, in a free comic. One of the things I wanted to ask you, German, it's sort of convenient that we, we start on 1908 really when we go start through the Fru comics because we've started, um, Steve just talked a lot about the cover, but 1908 was where we first saw what's looking like it might be a continuous thing and that's a little comic yeah. box up in the, the top left-hand corner of the, uh, of the cover um, with, the, with the grey phantom head, the, the Fru circle um, and the publishing information. We're going to get to it, of course, but 1909 we see it is there as well. That's not on the annual. I guess if it's in night on the front cover of maybe not 1911 because it's a uh, replica series, but but 1912. Do you think we'll see that again? I hope so. I really do. I like it. Um, I would like to see it. I would like to see it in all of them. It's you know, it, and then what I would like to see is that it's not just the same artist. So every year, maybe it's something different. Um, maybe every different artist has to so say that's Glenn Lumsden's. But then, if Daniel Picciardo does it, he has a different version. If uh, Antonio Lemus does it, he has a different version. So, you know, it, you know, I, I don't know. That's how I would like to see it. If I could be picky, if I could be choosy and have what I want, is that every single artist has their own corner box or comic box or whatever you want to call it and then depending on who the artist is it kind of goes up there because if artists were smart what they would do is they would not only do their cover in original art so they can sell that they'll also do their corner box or their comic box or whatever you want to call it in original as well so then you can sell that as well so you can get a double hit indeed um yeah I'm not sure. I'm not sold on it yet. I think the last time we, we had some such a dramatic change, I suppose, to the comics was when the yellow strip was a, when it was going across in the uh, 800 series. Um, that yeah, was, that, that was, was reintroduced by Stephen. Yeah, Stephen Shepherd. Yeah, and he did that briefly. Um, I, it was was only a handful of comics where that came back. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, certainly the title started being across the top again, and that seems to have um, faded from from trend again. So I don't know. It'll be it'll be interesting. Um, it's it's nice at the moment. I'm like I'm with you. I like the novelty of it. Um, if it's still the same corner box in five years' time, um, as good as Glenn Lumsden's art is, you might be starting to go. Oh, hang on, that's starting to get stale. So look, it's an it's a nice little initiative. It's they've done it for two issues. It'll be interesting to see if they keep going with it. Yeah, and the staleness or the sameness is the problem that we have with the replica issues where you have that same cover for two and a half years, 10 issues. Yeah. I would like to see a corner box, you know, it can be the same. I don't have mine on me, but it can be the same design. In the yeah, and the, sta- the same through logo and the same information, you know, the price yeah, and that sort of stuff. the actual drawing of the Phantom can change for every cover up. Yeah, uh, similar as what Jeff does with his um, with his Sundays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Anyway, the uh, the Christmas specials. Stephen sort of touched on it. It's it's got four um, uh, Tony uh, sorry, four Tony DePaul stories, four newspaper stories. 
Uh, three of them are Sundays, unless I missed my mark on that. Uh, two Sundays, two dailies. So the first one, which we're showing now on the screen, is the free Aver front, which we get another Misty Mountains. Um, the second time we've seen uh, these Amazons, I guess you can call them, um, Warrior Women. Um, I, I didn't. First time I read this story when we reviewed it for the first time, I didn't actually like it as much. But when I read it for the actual Christmas annual, I actually enjoyed it a lot more. And um, there was a lot of, you know, there was a bit of politics, but there was a lot of like hidden elements like the lady didn't only meant to injure the phantom, not kill the phantom with the little uh, dagger, which you see down here, if you see it on screen, you know, that kind of was interesting. Um, you know, especially because it goes, you see that dagger going in the phantom for four Sundays. So for a whole month, it's basically, uh, well, five weeks actually, you know, the phantom has this dagger in them and stuff like that. So that was a nice little point as well. Um, you know, the phantom pulling it out of him, the barb, that was just like, oh, you know, that, that made everyone wince, I think. I think so. Um, yeah, it's interesting that he carries a spare phantom costume as well. That was another little interesting point from that. Also um, interesting that he's happy to leave it for vultures to pick over. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, it was an enjoy. It was it was, it was a, you know it was a fun story. I I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a lot more. Um, and then how basically they're trying to uh, come back. You know they where was it? So on the on the end ones you've got the you've got the Bunga, no Luaga, sorry, and then you've got the Avarian warriors renounce their allegiance to the Kakan and they basically go with the deserter. So that's a nice little touch as well. So I don't think we'll see the end of them. No, no. And then we go on and have um, uh, the spy ships, uh, spy ships, sorry, um, Lifeblood and Lolongo Forest as well. Um, I'm just reading off the back there. I've, it's got five stories on the back. Yeah, and Lifeblood. So you oh, got Lifeblood. two. So, yep. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the spy ship, uh, which is famous for the fans of being in Australia in a um, what do you call it in a newspaper story, which is the first time. Um, also, I also like how you've kind of got Cardia again being shown. You've got uh, Babadan. Um, so you, these secondary characters, which have got nothing to do with the actual story are being introduced and you're learning more about them in that, which, again, goes back to our point that we said before about how Tony is really trying to establish these secondary characters, which, let's be honest, Lee Fork neglected for a long time. Also um, uh, notable for the uh, inclusion of the cameo by... Um, Jamie Diaz, the Phantom fan that a lot of people will know of on uh, on Facebook, a uh, big collector of original art and uh, friend to many of these creators. And Jamie um, makes a, a cameo as Carter in uh, one of the one of the Roughnecks in uh, in Spy Ship. Mm. The other thing I really like about it is that you learn about a lot of these other um, uh, people that are actually in the Vault of the Missing Man, like. I really enjoy the Vault in the Missing Man. It's one of my one of my favourite uh, elements of the Skull Cave. It's such a, a largely untapped area. There's been uh, there's been two stories in the newspapers, and there's been about five stories in Team Phantom in where um where there's been people created. And Tony DePaul, in a sense, has gone well. Okay, here's there's Ambrose. There's uh, Thomas Paine in here. Um, uh, there's, you know, there's, oh, who is it? Uh, Key Panjang, who's an Indonesian freedom fighter, uh, you know, and there's a couple of others and stuff like that, which are all stories that either either other creators could kind of like jump on and go, well, hang on, here's a story for me to go. Or Tony has got these stories in, um, uh, at the back of his, you know, in his back pocket for when he wants to pull out when he's got nothing else to write about. So. I, like, I really like that, and um, I think it's clever 
and it has the potential. And you know me, I like to have everything tied up neatly and stuff like that. It has the potential to be able to merge the various universes even closer by Eternity Poor putting out all these little um, mm. uh, little, little options for, for creators to be able to, um, to jump on the back of. Yeah, and it's probably just worth pointing out for YouTube listeners that uh, or watchers that um, the story that you're seeing on screen, that's not a scan of the actual annual, isn't it? That's a story from no. a different public. So, no, so these are, these are actually the proper sun. So this is the full Sunday put into a portrait version. It's the only it's the scan I've got. Um, yep. So, yeah, so with what, so with just what you see... Sure people, the annual doesn't have that yellow band across the top of the page. The Christmas story, no, it doesn't. Um, no. yeah, yeah, sorry, so, yeah, so but this is what basically the whole Sunday where I think the through one kind of merges some a little bit. So, look, I, I really enjoy the story. There's, um, uh, you know, there's Jamie, which you talked about before. There's, there's some great action. You learn about past phantoms, you know, um, some of the artwork, some of like this, um, here when the, the, um, where you've got. The Phantom and George Bass are rowing in the in the misty sea and stuff like that. There's some great artwork that Jeff that Jeff has done in here as well. So he's, he's done a, he's done an amazing job. It's highly detailed. I also like how you've got, there's a lot of narration in the sense of the Phantom saying what's happened, but he's mixed it up with the Phantom reading out of a book, but it also actually happening as well so that's quite clever so it's not all the samey mm. if you can i'm just trying to make sure i'm on the same page as you can you flick forward like two or three pages perhaps the the scene where heloise the has the flashback there we are um so i really like that scene there where no go back where you were um so we're on page 53 if you're in the um in the christmas issue um, yeah, that's it there, Jim. Where um, Heloise, it has that one of those breakouts where it comes back to the Chronicle room and Heloise hears something about an ancestor that goes, oh, he, she, he had an uncomfortable feeling about someone and couldn't explain why. That's what I felt like about the Nomad. So we have that connection of the phantom line and, and the phantom instinct, if you like, um, being shown as, as um, generational. And we've never, we've never had this, this level of continuity in our phantom strip ever. No. Um, which is one of the things that I really like about what Tony DePaul's done. He's he lives and breathes the Phantom and joining all these little dots and stuff like that. And you know, you, you know, we're lucky enough in the sense that we talk to him quite a bit, um, and he listens to the podcast, and then he kind of like tells us, "Oh, you missed this bit," or you you know, and tells us off for not reading carefully, or you know, or whatever. But there's a lot of care which. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to bag a dead man, but Lee Fort never had that level of care. It's it's just different approaches and. Um, Lee Falk wrote what he wrote, and I think we just need to appreciate that. And, and you're right; you can we can stray into the area of feeling like we're bagging someone who created what we love and spend so much time over. Um, Tony DePaul, I don't think there's any doubt that since he's been in, in charge of the script over the last twenty some years, um, he's been way more mindful of a continuity, and we're seeing that play out over over decades now. In, and we just talked about the Daily Story with Savannah. Um, her coming back from story from 10 plus years ago. So Tony DePaul really is playing the long game. And um, we see that uh, that attitude come through. Even this spy ship is not related to any of the long game story, but we still have that hints of it um, of Heloise in this instance, um, her response to hearing the story, that sort of stuff. I just wanted to raise this one where, um, now we don't see it often, but the Phantom, the 13th Phantom, uh, who's the hero in this story, actually kills the main bad guy. Um, so you, you don't see the Phantom killing very often. Um, no, look, I'll, I'll say something about that when we get to the annual as well because there's a Lee Fork story where we see the Phantom um, killing people. So, yeah, the uh, the old jungle saying the Phantom never kills, um, probably just as accurate as every other old jungle saying, as in, yeah, most of the time. <laughs> Poetic license on that one. Yeah, yeah. But no, look, it's, it's a great story. I really enjoyed it. I like, um, I want to see if I can, oh, no, I didn't really do it. 
Um, there's a, what do you call it, on the last, the last panel where you've got Heloise folding her arms of the story and then you get the phantom behind her folding the arms. Yep. It's, it's very iconic. It's very, um, yeah, it, you know, again, it's one of those little small little things that a lot of people wouldn't notice, but for some people who look at it and kind of, you know, there, there, there's care, there's love, there's attention, um, and it's, yeah, it, it, I, I really enjoy that. Yeah, yeah, no worries. All right, um, Lolongo Forest, I already talked about that one um, in some detail for the best of 2021 story, but I really enjoyed that. Um, again, uh, as with all of these, I think you really do get a renewed appreciation for the whole story when you're reading them um, in, in comic book form. Um, so I don't want to, you know, we, we could go into to hours on each story. But um, just to summarise, uh, Germ for Yourself, The Lolongo Forest, and Unfinished Business, which, again, are part of that continuity that Mike Manley in particular, through the daily, I think, is where Tony really hones his... his um, his continuity, um, and then the, the Sunday stories are around that. But uh, your thoughts on the Longo Forest and uh, unfinished business? Um, this is the Longo Forest here. Oh, oh, so let me. Earlier on in the, the podcast, we talked about the Longo wearing the the certain attire. Uh, this is an example of it here, where Mike Manley. Um, and if you look at it, every time he's drawn the Longo. They have the same type of shields and they have the same type of um, dress. So they have the, I guess, the, the headdress with the feathers uh, on their head. Uh, they have a, what would you call it, an oval shape um, shield. And then they have, now there's a specific name for that dress. I can't remember it off the top of my head, uh, but it's, a, it's an African traditional, lack of a better word, dress. But it's not a dress. Um, and so every time Mike Manley has actually drawn Longo Warriors, they all look the same. So we talked about that with the Mori. Uh, it's also very similar as well. So I just wanted to make make mention of that. To be honest, this wasn't one of my... I didn't really enjoy this story at all. Um, um, I, I enjoy... What I've enjoyed most about this story is probably the continuity, i.e. with the Longo dress, but also with the Queen. Um, because uh, up until recently, it was always Chief Lolonto, uh, who was an older-looking man. Uh, and this queen has not actually got a name, and we don't know anything about uh, if she was the daughter of that chief who had 24 kids, or whether she was married to someone and then has kind of taken over it. So, um, yeah, again... Uh, I've been going fairly deep in a couple of stories and I've just uh, done a bit of research on the Longo. So uh, I enjoyed this story for that research, but I didn't actually enjoy the story, so to speak. Fair enough. Which, yeah. And I, I've gone back and read it after everyone rated it as the best, you know, in their best 20, uh, 21 story. And yeah, I still can't, still can't understand it personally. Fair enough. What do you think about the um, the, the the daily colorist at the moment? Is uh, always oh, making, horrible, particularly the Phantom's belt buckle always being red. Uh, so that doesn't really bother me. What color should it be? I, I would have had it as a silver. Yeah, I'm just. I've, I've always know. thought of it as a, as a grey. It's a metal. It's it's yeah, as a as a grey or a silver metal. Yeah. Have you got a Phantom comic right in front of you? Let's just try. Right one, like Femme Fatale has got, uh, so right here, Femme Fatale is the next comic we're going to be looking at. That's the, the silver I would have. Uh, yeah. So I've just quickly pulled one out. Hang on, let's, let's stop sharing this. Uh, I just pulled this one out as a back issue. That's a red or a yellow. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. It makes sense, it being a silver one but I don't think that's the only problem with that the colorist is making with these I would <laughs> much rather um, we know that Jeff does his own coloring and I think the Sunday strip is much better for it um, and I, kind I think of the, um, the the daily colorist doesn't have a huge palette and is very much um, 
colouring for a, a web page, I think, not really thinking about how it gets printed on the strip. Yeah. On the, on the, paper. the concern I have is... And I'm a stickler for these type of things, which you know, and stuff like that, is that there's been errors that have been creeping in because of the daily stuff. Like, I was doing, uh, I was reading a story and it had uh, Jane Carey, who's the 19th Phantom's wife, who is blonde, like blonde, blonde. It had her as a brunette. And it just, you know, for most people, they're like, oh, yeah, don't even really notice it. But for the, for the, for the tragics like us, I look at that and I go, no, that's wrong. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's I mean, if, you, if you're not happy with Jane Carey having two different colour hairstyles, no wonder you're um, no wonder you're upset at Lee Fork and his lack of continuity across eighty years, <laughs> seventy years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I really enjoyed this other story, the unfinished business, though. Yep, uh, it's a shorter story. Um, I like how like the Phantom plays, you know, um, this is a real like dad moment. Like he's like, you know, he's wanting to find out about what this guy knows about his dad, um, which is what, any, you know, if we had the means and our daughter was in that case, we'd probably do something very similar. Um, and then you don't realize it's the Phantom until what, you know, four or five, um, you know, panels you know, four or five, maybe a week, maybe even two weeks later, do you realise that, hey, actually, this is our phantom. This is, this is you know, this is the phantom and not just some, um, you know, random person. So I like that. And then you've got this big panel here where it's like he's realised, oh, hang on, no, this isn't, um, you know, and then he punches him again just so he can skull mark him. I, I really like that. Um, and then the other thing I liked about it was how he... He goes, does the swim, and then he, um, you know, pretends that he's on a um, on a fishing trip. I, I just, I just like it. It's, 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 it's a short story, but it's, um, uh, you know, it, it was fun. Yeah, and it also sets up the uh, the nomad um, working or, or working through why was that? Why would the Phantom come to me? And is is Heloise Walker a connection? So you know, it just provides yeah, yeah. that other, another opportunity for um, uh, for a story thread that uh, that Tony can pull out at some point down the track. Yeah, and then we see the Phantom drinking something besides milk, uh, which is the last panel, no, the second last panel of the story. Um, so yeah. Yep. 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 All right, um, and we've we've talked about uh, lifeblood many times before. Fun little story to finish off. So overall, um, what you, were you happy with the Christmas story as a package? I was. I really enjoyed it. Um, uh, really enjoyed it. Um, I enjoyed getting the, you know, like the little, I guess you'll call it the bonus, the um, the the lifeblood story at the end, little short story. It would have been very easy for them just to fill it with ads and forum letters, and, and that has a place. But for me, it was like, oh, it's something else. It was like a little Christmas bonus, a little, you know, another little Christmas present inside the Christmas uh, thing. So I really enjoyed that. It was nice to see uh, Dean Rankine, who I oh, once talked about, and he said that one of his goals was to actually become a published Phantom creator. So in having that conversation with him four or five years ago and then seeing this and remembering that conversation, it was it was nice to be able to go, hey, he's met what he's always wanted. Yeah, yeah, cool. And uh, we talked briefly about the cover, but just also to briefly talk about the back cover too, Glenn Lumsden with his own interpretation as a, as a, a little panel for each of those stories, which I thought was really nice. One thing that I would probably think might have been missing from here, and maybe the only way they would have fitted in, is to not have the life's blood, perhaps. But I would like to see a splash page for the start of each new yeah. story, to be honest. Like, you, these it ones... It breaks it up a little bit better, doesn't it? It would. I mean, even the... They've, they've done it. They've had some sort of success with it through in... I'm trying to find... So that's the end of the spy ship story. Um, yeah. runs to the finish and then just literally the next page uh, it's just got the heading at the top and it's unfinished business so so I just like to see a splash page to, to break up each yeah. story and 
look, they've done it with the annual. We'll get yes, to the annual did. in a second. But, you know, they've done it with the annual. Um, so you're right. I do agree with you that, you know, it kind of breaks it up. And But I also like having the short story. So Yep, and, and look, there's only... Never win. Uh, I'd probably, I'd love to see a splash page. It wasn't necessarily like that one with the the panel, the the annual there, but almost a new cover for that particular story. And and there's only so much you can you can spend money on, I suppose. And and would that and actually... you could use those panels that uh, uh, Graham, uh, Glenn Lumsden has done on the back, which he showed as well. And yes. the only criticism that I have with Glenn on that is that he should have somehow incorporated Australia on the spy ship. <laughs> Maybe, maybe. All right, so that's uh, that's issue 1908. 1909, we've, I've, I've waved the cover in front of the camera once already. Uh, we've talked about it a few times. Femme Fatale, um, which is uh, the new story from Eric, Andreas Ericsson and Ivan Rodriguez in the artwork. Um, now, am I right in saying that that story, was that the 1,000th or have I got that wrong? No. The one it's not. So that's not the 1,000th Team Phantom story, which Andreas yeah. did write. Yeah. <laughs> so this was a story actually created for free. For free, before Andreas took over yes. Team Phantom. It's just taken that long for it to be created. From what I understand, this uh, Ivan's the third artist who was scheduled this story. Yeah, right. Um, okay. Uh, there was some delays. Um, and Ivan, look, let's, let's forget about it. Let's focus on the story. I'll share it. Um, for sure. You know, for me, look, this, you know, and I hope Andreas is not going to be offended by this. The story's nothing flash, but I enjoyed the story a lot. It's a fun story. And, you know, there's you know, there's nothing that you're going to be able to um, like you know, like go, oh wow, well, you know, this this and that, and you know, game changing or life changing or phantom changing, but it is a story. It's one of those stories that you read, that you have fun reading. It's got some good moral moral elements, I guess. Um, it's got some beautiful art, like this one here. Yes. Uh, on page nine, I believe it is. That is amazing. Like. Ivan deserves to draw more fans and stories purely based on this. And he also did it in his other story, which was the Raven crossover as well. But that, that, is page, that page nine, that's a, a cover in itself, isn't it? Yeah. So I actually asked Andreas, I said, did you ask him what was the script this or did he just do it? And Andreas, he, you know, he, he did say, look, I did actually include it in the script and I did kind of plan it that it was to be a one page. And, and he, you know, he did it. I, he showed me a screenshot and I, I can't, if I can find it, I'll um, show it up on the YouTube. I'll, I'll impose it when we're talking now. But it was one or two lines of saying, full page, the Phantom and Devil being menacing looking or something like that. And Ivan's knocked that out of the park. He's knocked that brief out of the park. They look menacing. You've got the lions coming from the phantom's chest. You've got the devil, you know, with the saliva and the, the rabies look of him coming out of it. He looks like a scary wolf. And it's all, it's, this is not what the phantom and devil actually look like, but it's actually how these bad guys who have been scared are actually picturing and retelling what the phantom looks like. And I, I love it. Yeah, and I think it's not just that examples like that. If you want to go to page eighteen, um, just the way that um, Ivan breaks out away from the panels all the time, the bottom half of the page there is a really compelling image as well. Um, that is that is backgrounded to the the panels above it, um, and just the the way. He... I like I like that as well, and I think you've you've said it as well, and it it breaks away from the nine panel boringness. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I thought the, the the dialogue was a little bit wordy, if I'm honest. Um, the I, I liked the story as well as you. Um, the and it was a, a good redemption story um, of the the young girl who's sort of the the anti the antagonist, if you like. Um, and there's and there's a redemption for her, her and potentially a sequel out of it. Um, I, I wouldn't have called it a fun story. It's certainly an enjoyable story. Um, fast paced, you know. 
um, didn't have to think too hard about it. Just enjoyed the the, the pace of it and the the artwork. Yeah, I, I take your point about the wordiness, and I wonder because we've 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 said the same things about uh, Pity Anson as well in the past, and I wonder if it's because you know they're Europeans, they're, they're used to the wordier words where a lot of the other writers like uh, um, Andrew Constant goes the opposite where he almost has no words. Um, so I wonder if it's to do with where they're, you know, brought up and, and, oh, I'm and sure, how yeah. stuff like I'm that sure that, well. that sort of stuff is involved. I've never, um, never tried to write my own comic stories or anything like that, so I've got no idea how difficult it is to try and express the movement of a plot without... Um, that's dependent entirely on dialogue and art without the the normal um, authorial control of descriptors and um, being able to to spend time describing a setting. You've, you've got to rely on a few keywords and, and a few brushstrokes to get that across. So it's a real talent. And, um, yeah, it just I just felt that this one, some pages just felt yeah, like you yeah. were bogged down with words. It was, which one was it? There was one page. Yeah, this one here. Yeah, yeah. So what is that, page, page 20, 20, 21? There's a fair bit of words. Actually, one thing which we haven't discussed yet, which I do want to actually discuss, is, is it was really she figured out that the Phantom and Mr. Walker were the same person rather easily. It makes you wonder why more people haven't figured that out when you've got two people walking around with a big, large wolf. Um, yeah. you know, surely it's you know, surely it's easy to be able to identify that. Hang on, they're both around the same place at the same time. They both got the same dog. Mm, are they the same person? You know, a bit like, uh, and it kind of takes a bit of Nicky out of um, uh, Superman. You know, his his disguise is his little uh, his little fringes on his forehead, and he doesn't have glasses yeah. on. You know, uh, it, you know. And knowing Andreas, I'm sure he, I'm sure that was designed, and he was having a bit of fun with it like that. But it was just, you know, I'm kind of reading it, and I'm going, yeah, why haven't more people figured out that Mr. Walker <laughs> and the fans are the same? Person? As with most things uh, in the comic world, and certainly the Phantom Universe, you've got to suspend a bit of belief from time to time. Yeah, but I just thought it was, it was a not. It, I, I enjoyed that little bit from Andreas as well. It was kind of like a. You know, ha having fun at the Phantom's expense. Yeah, yeah. And while we're while we're talking about that story, we should probably talk about the cover because the cover is also by on. And I'm just double checking to make sure I'm right, but the cover is also by Ivan, um, who's done the story art. And um, I, I like I like the cover, and I think that it it, it gives you a good uh, introduction to what the story is going to be about. But I can't help but think, but that maybe the uh, can't help but think that the the image of the Phantom and Devil on page nine, um, whilst it is not as directly story related, but that would have been one heck of a cover um, as well. So, yeah, yeah, it's a good point. Um, I wonder if it was also because Ivan's like, well, I don't want, you know, just an interior panel page to be yeah. the, the the cover. I want to do something different. So, yeah, for sure, for sure. But no, I, I do really like that cover as it stands. I think he's done um, a great job of sculpting both characters, and it's not often that we'll have a second character just standing. It's a it's a different sort of a cover. We don't often have the two characters just standing, posing for the camera, so to speak, um, as we have in this one. So, yeah, um, um, we do need, do need to talk about the air pirates. I was just going to say the filler story was the uh, the gaslight um, scourge of the air pirates, and it's the first part. Doesn't it say last time we had the um, the Grey Malkin four. story. We knew. Sorry, I think it's four. I think from memory, Jim Shepherd, not Jim Shepherd, Dudley. Uh, oh no, three parts. It says here, I'm delighted to bring to you yet another episode in a new three part Phantom by Gaslight. Story which has been written and drawn by Jason Paulos. Okay, so, so that's in the, 
that's in the message from the publisher. Um, so good, good to know. Three parts scourge of the uh, scourge of the air pirates, and I'm just showing my copy to the camera for no reason because you've got the picture <laughs> on screen. <laughs> I'm sure um, there's a lot of things you do for no reason, Dan. Yeah, no doubt. Last time <laughs> you are a teacher. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so we've got um, the third in the, what is the, the Gaslight Stories series of stories, I suppose, all all drawn by Jason Paulus, all set in the same time. Um, what's your What's your initial thoughts when you read part one of the uh, Scourge of the Air Pirates? Now I want to be controversial here, but when I think Gaslight, this is what I think. Floating balloon pirate ships, uh, people dressed up weirdly, and, um, you know, like this female phantom here, you know, dressed like gaslighty. And this is this is what I was envisioning. These this type of over the top gaslighty uh steampunky and stuff like that that's what i was thinking when i thought we were going to be the original gaslight series the first one you, you know it kind of had elements the second one which was the gray malican had elements as well and i've talked about what i struggled with that this one i'm reading it and i'm going this is what i envisioned um and so i actually enjoyed this one so far i've enjoyed this one dare I say it, more than the other two. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure at this stage. Um, you're right, this is definitely more steampunk, and I, I, I don't know enough about the genres to know whether or not Gaslight and steampunk are two different things. You're right, this is far more steampunk than the other two um, in terms yeah. of those. Sorry? Uh, so on YouTube, you'll see on the, on the last page, uh, first panel, you'll see a car. And it's, you know, and it's, yeah, steampunky. It's powered by steam um, in a sense. But, yeah, it's just, yeah, there's another example of, of, of it in a sense. Yeah, for sure. So at the end of the day, the, the, the um, hook of the story is the air pirates and you have these, yeah. um, these floating um, Vehicles that have not existed in real life and, and are coming together for for this um, version. I'm, I'm not sold on it yet because I, you know, um, as I've said many times, you know, those fantasy stories and the science fiction stories are not really my cup of tea. And, and the more steampunk you go, the certainly the further you go down that path with the Phantom. So um, I've got no problem with. You know, it, it depends. I, as I say, I don't know the definitions. Gaslight to me. It, could easily be like the Grey Malkin because it was set in an era where the streetlights were gaslights. And that is, to me, you know, the genre. I might be completely wrong on that. And uh, and steampunk is more where it's at, in which case I'm not as much a fan of it as a, as a fandom genre. But I love the fact that the fandom can be placed in lots of different genres and, and make sense to yeah. lots of different people. What do you think about the actual story? I thought the story was interesting. Um, it's going to be probably a month before we see uh, part two. Um, yeah, that's, that, that is a shame that it's been sort of bog not bogged behind the annual. That, that's unfair, but it's certainly, but by the time you've got this, then the annual, then the uh, the replica series, it's, it's a shame that yeah. they weren't be able to, because the Grey Malkin, they absolutely did pump them out. They were in eight consecutive comics. I thought that worked yeah. very well. It did. It did. I would have, if I had to be picky, um, which, you know, I guess we have to be point out the, the criticisms that we do have is I would have rather a standalone backup story in this one and then had the part one, part two and part three are a lot more closer. Yeah. Yeah, look, um, it's, it's hard to say hard to say with the story, you know, it's, you tell me it's a, there's three parts to it and, and so we've got act one, if you like. Uh, we've got the, the setup, we've met the characters, um, we understand that... Um, uh, the the uh, the femme fatale I guess is is in this one as well, which I guess is appropriate given the the the, back, the story that it's back up to. But um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. So I'll look forward to to unpacking it more once we see the, I guess the rest of the story. All right, um, we might move then to femme fatale uh, away from femme fatale, I should say, to the nineteen hundred and tenth. 
issue of the Phantom that used by free in the last 60 plus years. And that is, of course, the 2022 annual, the uh, Guardian of the Eastern Dark themed 220 page collection cover by Glenn Lumsden. We've already heard what Steve had to say about that. Um, I think that that his criticism maybe was a little unfair because if you're, um, unless you're a, an avid fandom fan, you may not know what Guardian of the Eastern Dark means and a, and a figure of Zal on the front cover may not mean a bunch to you anyway. I think the cover is it works really well as a standalone. It's going to draw people in anyway. Um, and then you've got Zal on the back. So I've got no problems with that. Jim, um, your thoughts on Glenn Lumsden's work there? I, I love the cover. It would work brilliantly as a print. Uh, Glenn needs to hurry up and come to a, to a couple of uh, comic cons and supernovas so he can get all these comics and prints and stuff like that signed because, um, yeah. Um, so, Glenn, if you listen to this, um, come back over to Perth and maybe do the Sydney one as well because uh, I'm sure we've all got some uh, comics that we wouldn't mind getting signed and, and stuff like <laughs> well, that. Well, if he's going to keep pumping out covers, like we've, we're only yeah. talking free through covers and um, two of them are Glenn Lumsden's work and he's now got the got the comic book corner box as we've said so he's, yeah, he's owning the fandom at the moment yes <laughs> yes um, no so look uh, I I understand where Steve's coming from and I think I you know it's almost a pity that I think the reason why we don't have that on the front cover I'm trying to do it so the glare is not there, is because the Phantom punching this bad guy is so big that yeah. you, there's no room for the corner box plus, you know, the Phantom versus the Eastern Dark to be on there because this is so big. And that's a great problem to have. Like, and I'd, I'd much rather keep a clean cover than, than clutter it up. I've talked about Team Phantom and, or, or the Phantom and stories having too much on the front, I think, and I think that... I'd rather err on the side of a, a good, clear, simple cover with a great big image like that. An option is having it on the spine. So yeah. here you've got the 20s. And I, I love the fact that we've actually got the spine. We've got, you know, the little skull, which, uh, you know, if you've got yours, if you're on audio, you're about to look at it. It's at the bottom. And you've got the 20, 20 22 annual in writing as well. You could have it along there. Um, but, oh, there's a the skull at the top as well. Um, <laughs> but look, we're nitpicking. I would much rather nitpick about this stupid thing that's still in my plastic when I opened it. <laughs> um, I would like to know if there is anyone, and I am holding up re replica number 32. It's a great cover of the Phantom stabbing a shark. I don't know how that managed to get... Uh, that, would not get uh, that would not get across uh, King Feature's desk today. Um, so, but... You know, has anyone, anyone, if you have, please let me know. ChronicleChamber at gmail.com. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. If you have actually read this, please, please get in touch with me. Me, it's still in my plastic. Um, you so know, Jeff, I use your podcast to let you know that I read it. Is that... Is oh, have you? Did you read? Did you read this? You got to be careful. It opens. Uh, it opens landscape. So that's okay. it. If there's anyone else that have actually that has actually read the replica, please get a hold of. It. If there's a second person in a whole of Australia, all 25 million of us, if there's a second one. Please get in touch with me. Wait, as, soon, as soon as you open it up and look at the back cover, and you see it's a Marshall sister story, you've got to read a Marshall sister story. <laughs> So talking about censorship, I reckon the Marshall sisters, if there is ever a, a Ray Moore or Wilson McCoy story that was to get censored, I reckon that will be one of them. That is very, no, very highly if you're, of if you're uncomfortable with Savannah uh, slipping into bed with a comatose phantom, how do you feel about um, phantom willingly kissing a Marshall sister through the car door and lining up the second one? <laughs> you both swell girls. Lay it on me. <laughs> I want to know if now look no we won't go there but I don't know many sisters that would line up and go yeah okay you kiss the same we'll kiss the same boy and stuff like that <laughs> like you know maybe you know alright well look never happened to me the, um, replica, <laughs> the, the replica is what it is they made the decision to keep going look personally I've got no problem with it because again this is the only time I'm ever going to get my hands on anything that looks like a, a number 32 uh, so I'm happy to I've, – I've got a, a folder that is just the replicas, counting up one through to 32 now. 
Um, and I enjoy collecting them that way because, it, you know, you can flick through it and dream about what it might be like if they're all real ones. Um, but let's put that to one side. I know that you're probably going to say, oh, I wish there'd been a map or I wish there'd been a mask or some stickers or some bookmarks or whatever it might be. But it is what it is. We got that. Let's focus on the actual book, the the Garden, of Guardians of the Eastern, Eastern Dark Annual. Um, what did you think of this as a concept? So just to explain, we've got um, nine stories, I think. Uh, the first seven are all Lee Fork stories. Um, Guardian of the Eastern Dark was the first story that he wrote to feature this mob of bad guys in 1977, um, drawn by Cy Barry. The first five, first three, sorry, the first three stories uh, all times where Lee Fork and Cy Barry went back to the well of the Eastern Dark with the Eastern Dark and then the Eastern Dark at Genora. Um, it really must have got in Lee Fork's craw, I think, in the last decade to yeah. whether, because this, you know, we've talked about Baba Dan um, and, uh, sorry, Baba Boo, General Baba Boo and the Singh Pirates as recurring villains, but Guardians of the Eastern Dark have probably recurred as often as anybody that uh, well, Lee Fork back. Lee Falk never brought the Sing Pirates back. Never yes. brought never brought the Vultures back. Never brought Hydra back. He did General Babu probably eight, mm. ten times. Yeah. And then after that, yeah, you're right. You've got the Guardian of the uh, the not the Guardian, the, the Eastern Dark. Um yeah, obviously obviously yeah, obviously it did resonate with him. Um look, I'm all for three, themes. Three stories between ninety five and ninety nine where he's yeah. gone back. The Eastern Dark with George Olson and Keith Williams as the artists. Yeah. I've said before, I love themes, themed annuals. I love the Girl Fans and the War Annual, the uh, eight generations or the eight decades, eight different countries. Um, the War Annual is probably one of my best free issues ever. Um, you know, love these. And then there was a... Um, Love these annuals. It's not just a mismatch of random stories, which it was for so long, for probably the first 30 years of annuals. Um, it was a, a great choice. I like how there was, and we'll go through the stories in a second, I like how there was a nice range of stories. There was the Cybarry stories. Some of the, some of the Cybarry stuff was him at his best. Some of it was him not at his best, but then there was some good... George Olsen, Keith Williams, uh, some good solid work in there. Uh, and then I enjoyed the modern twist of it as well. The Moonstone one I thought was a great addition to it. Uh, the story was fun. Well, it wasn't a fun story themed, but it was an enjoyable story. And then you had the short story, modern story, even more modern story by um, Duncan Munro and Daniel Picciardo as well, which it felt like a well-balanced annual. It had something for everyone. So it had the classic stories. Then it had some newer stories, especially if not everyone's got Moonstone comics in their collection. So for a lot of people, that was the first time they've actually read those. And then there was even a, a brand, brand, brand spanking new story that me, who've got all the Moonstone stories and has got digital copies of all the Fork stories and 10 copies of those stories it's got something that i haven't even read which meant as i showed before if you're on if you're on audio i actually had to open my annual so for me that is a brilliant thing about this annual is that it had something for everything and even the old crusties who have got copies of everything there is a reason for you to open this annual and look even the even the lee fork stories we say and and, and, and through have a fair history, uh, certainly through their first 40 years, of constantly reprinting stories and, and things like the Maharaja's Daughter, we know has appeared li literally 12, 13 times in through comics. But even some of these, like, and, and I've opened up to the splash page for Raiders of the, of the Eastern Dark, um, that was first published in the newspapers in 1996. The last time it appeared in a through comic was in 1996. So this is literally only the second printing of that story. And unless you happen it's to pick up a copy of 1133 back in 96, 25, six years ago, you've never read this story either. So yeah. there's, a, there's a lot of new um, phantom goodness in, in this story. And I, I agree with you in what you say there about picking up the Moonstone. We haven't seen um, Fru do that very much before. Um, and, and as Stephen pointed out, colour once before. So um, as Stephen has pointed out, that's the story that appears in colour. 
Um, so for them to throw colour in the middle mm. of the annual is is um, something unusual as well. And um, and then, like you say, you know, bringing in something completely new um, from 2022 era creators um, just goes to show that this, you know, 1977 to 1922, 50 plus years, um, we've got this story arc over that period of time and it's all condensed into one volume. Yeah, yeah. No, it was good. Uh, should we quickly go through some of those stories? Yeah, look, I don't need to. I don't feel like I need to spend heaps of time um, talking about the stories um, because you know I think people can can read them on their own. But I, I thought there was some um, some telling well, stuff. Let's let's just we'll just even if we don't spend much time, but we'll flick through them. If you're on YouTube, we're going to flick through uh, the stories. So this is the Guardian of the Eastern Dark. Um, look, some of the some of the art in this story is not Lee Fork at its best. Um, but I really, you know, but some of it, like this here, where you've got the, the Zal idol in black, you've got the flames, you've got the smoke, you've got old man Moz in the corner. You know, there's still some great, um, in some great story in this. I also like how old man Moz, like, drops the, you know, stops talking every so often to have a drink or, or yeah. something like that, and it frustrates Rex. And, you know, um, it, it's just kind of a little bit funny, and um, you know, and then, and then he goes, "Oh, it was the knife," and then the Phantom like, "Oh, which one's that? Is that the one that married this person, or is that you know?" And um, you know, and then you kind of learn a little bit about. So you learn about about the the seventh Phantom who married a French queen. The ninth Phantom rescued a rhino from from a swamp by pulling him out, and you know, so you just learn a little bit about. About past stuff, um, you know. Look, this here is what I was referring to earlier. The um, we're on page nine of the of the actual annual. Um, the Phantom's actually deliberately rolled a boulder down and crushed some guys. <laughs> He's yeah. sitting on the boulder, and their legs are poking out from under the boulder. There's no doubt that the Phantom killed people. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so look, you know, you're dealing with slave traders, so it's you know knocking a few of those off isn't. The end of the world. Oh no, that's exactly uh, right. <laughs> I just thought it was notable because we always say. Yeah. Um, and look, you, you mentioned the art. I think there's still some great um, little yes. extracts of art here. And for instance, if you can keep scrolling forward, it's on page um, 15 of the actual of the actual annual, where they identify that it's in to do with the slave trade. And uh, that no, go back there. You had it there. Um, the panel up the top right there. Um, no, nope, must have been one back further. A drug called heroin. That that would yeah, make a yeah. great T-shirt, I think, or or, uh, or a poster. I think you know, it's just it's a striking image of the of the Phantom, classic side Barry profile from an angle. You've got the shadow behind. Very simple, yep. but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's just there, there is there's some there's some great art in here, but then at the start. Some of it's a little bit lacking, so I'm not sure that's when if Cy was on holidays then or or whatever, which we know he didn't get many of them. Um, but look, it's 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 a hard hitting story. You're dealing with slave trading, you're dealing with drugs. Um, you know, I I enjoyed this story. This is a you know it, it's an enjoyable story. I you know, yeah, I really um, I thought. The, yeah, I, I like this as a story. I liked the setup. I probably enjoyed um, uh, all the the three Cy Barry stories more yep. um, across across the um, across the annual. Uh, I really liked J Jim Shepard's um, Jim Shepard's uh, piece that he wrote the the feature article on page thirty four. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I really liked the idea that it was almost like. Well, certainly Jim Shepard was putting his spin on what he thought Lee Fork might have been talking, uh, thinking. But the idea of having the Phantom as being this one sole force of good and on at sea you've got the Sing Pirates, and I hear what you say about Lee never going back to that well, but um, the, the Guardians of the Eastern Dark were like the land villains, the villains on the land yep. that you had to handle there. And, the, and then so he was drawn on those two places, and I really liked that idea. And gee, wouldn't it be um, wouldn't it be something if the the Raiders of the Eastern Dark and the Sing Pirates decided to team up at one point and attack the Phantom on all fronts? Yeah, look, you know, 
we've been critical of Jim Shepard in the past, but at times, but you know, like that article, that in depth like analysis and stuff like that is is gold. You know, he, does it say when he first wrote that? Uh, that's a really good question. Page thirty four. It was on. Um, I don't think it did. No, there's was, no date on it. Was it from the encyclopedia or something like that? Um, yeah, it couldn't tell. No. I don't think so. It looks it's it's too expensive to have been. In the encyclopedia. Yeah, but you know, some like that would have been written. It, it, you know, it was probably published probably in twenty a, years ago, or something like that. Yeah, but it's still it's still relevant now, and you don't get you know Jim Shepard. He, he did a brilliant job, and I like stuff like that. And I also one of the things I like about it is where I have been critical is he can sometimes not sit on the fence enough and let the story tell itself, and he can't, you know. But in this, he just he's just dealing with facts. He's not talking about. Oh yeah, Tim Fanderman did this wrong, or Tim Fanderman did this. He's just talking about facts, and 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 it's insightful. And so, yeah, no, I really enjoyed that. Hmm. Um, I will, I will give myself a quick shout out. Page forty one there. Um, page Is that 41. in this story? No, that's in the next one. That's in Guardians. Um, in Guardians of the Eastern Dark, I think is the the name of the story. So, so just wish- the Eastern Dark, page forty one. Uh, okay. Cool. So this is the second story that we're now talking about. It's the second story, yeah. Um, so were there more drugs? Yeah, no, this one is the um, refugees. And, oh, yeah, the refugees, yep. Yep, so the next page, that's page 41 in the uh, in the comic, and, and it's yeah. all portrait style, landscape like you've got it there. That's the original art for that is hanging above uh, the lounge upstairs, and I'm very pleased to have that page in my collection. It's pretty cool. No worries. I think I've actually got a page from this one as well. Can't remember which one it is. Um, and look, the whole the whole story for me, it just speaks to the humanitarian values of the Phantom because he finds these refugees, people have been poorly treated, and then um, he rescues them, he saves them, he gets people to round up the other ones that are lost in the forest, hmm. uh, and then he goes and gets the bad guys who are who are causing this problem, um, and and lays waste to their lays waste to their um, uh, mode of operations. Yeah. I'm just trying to think. I'm sure I've got a page from here as well. Where is it? This one. This is the one that I've got. Yeah, right. I just said laying waste to their operations. That's the beginning of the the pirates when the the truck rolls down the hill and crashes into the the infrastructure there. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, no. Again, like... It's not a yeah. It, this is a is a good story. You know, I like the whole um, seven years ago. We you know he the Phantom did this. The you know there is a little bit of continuity in these stories, which we it must have been a bit of time when Lee Fork was doing that because nineteen seventy seven yeah. is also when the um, the Phantom got married. Seventy nine yeah. was when the twins were born. 85, or, or sorry, 87, 1987 was the story called The Twins' Eighth Birthday. So at that period yeah. of time, I must have been really mindful of how long ago yeah. since I wrote these stories. Yeah, there was some con- continuity in these stories, and I enjoy that. I yeah. enjoy when things match up. Um, so, and, and this is jumping ahead a bit um, to another story, and I'm just going to try and... Are we talking the- about the third story now, or are you going to, like, just skip ahead really and, like... Make I've, gone straight, I've gone straight to the fifth story. Um, and it's really just asked the question that you've just raised there around continuity. So in The Dark Pirates, which is the fifth story in the annual, um, it's almost like Lee Fork has decided, I'm really going to write another story about the uh, Eastern Dark, but I've forgotten lots of details. Um, and so, for instance, the... Uh, the spelling's different. <laughs> The spelling is different, so it's, and they spend quite a lot of time trying to explain why dark is D-A-double-K and, or D-A-R-K. Um, but also the god is different. They're now worshipping Moog instead of Zal. Um, so he, he's got the idea of, oh, I think it was double letters in the middle and consonants on either side. But um, I wonder, oh, I'm trying to find a page where it was. Oh, so here we are, page 114. The date of that is the 10th, 19th of October, if you want to look for that page. Um, but the 
the jungle remains quiet and uh, the old man saying that uh, where have the victims been sacrificed to the pagan god Moog, which has been destroyed by the phantom. So what's your thoughts? Should, should someone like Dudley Hogarth, when they're putting together an annual like this, should you pick up on continuity errors like that, that Moog became, uh, that Zal became Moog? So there you go. Um, so this must be the start of that story. Centuries ago, Phantom destroyed Dark's pagan god, Moog. Should the editorial team change that and make it continuous for the whole book? Or do you let that slide for the sake of authenticity? It's a very good question. Um, part of me is like, no, you've got to leave it as it is. But for those, but then the other part of me is like, no, we need to change. Or at the very least, you put in a page at the start of this story saying, you know, hey, there is, you know, Moog has been accidentally changed or, you know, Zal has accidentally been changed to Moog. Dark is accidentally D-A-K-K to D-A-R-K. And, you know, it's an opportunity for, uh, you know, you, you could create like a little essay on it. And, you know, you could kind of yeah. like say, you know, like, look, this happens in the fandom world. We have plenty of it. We have Morristown. We have Morrowan. We have Bengal. We have Bengali. You know, uh, you know, around the world, places can change. Maybe they changed Maybe, you know, you know, you can kind of do a bit of an editorial on, on it. Uh, and, you know, the people who just want to read a comic, they'll just, they'll just read the comic and they won't really care. They'll probably flip over it. But then the hardcore um, sad people like us will kind of like, go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, that's great. You know, and you're kind of fixing the continuity. I know um, with what you said about the changing or the editorial, Egmont used to do that. Like, for instance, when, um, when they had a scene of when Sandal Singh was, um, what do you call it, uh, president, prime minister, president, mm-hmm. uh, in the daily stories, they would edit that and put in Sandal instead or, you know, or, or something like that. So they'll mm-hmm. do that. Also with... Um, uh, Michelangelo, when Michelangelo created uh, the Phantom's Head, they would edit that bit out, or they just didn't publish it. And so, you know, Moons, uh, not Moonstone, Phantom Men uh, editorial did go down the route of fixing it. I think the easiest solution is doing a little essay on it. Yeah, and and it, I guess it becomes how long is a piece of a string, or, or when do you stop? Because um, if examples like what you're saying there with Tim Fantaman, they they created their own schism in the political world and we know that. And then so they had to do those sorts of things that what you're saying because they had different presidents and, and the, the daily strip didn't. So they had to work with that. Um, that becomes a much more complicated thing. Um, you know, maybe 10 or 12 times in this story, uh, someone would have had to re-letter Zal across the top of, of Moog and that would have tidied that up. But I take your point, where do you stop with that then? Because there are further continuity problems by the time you then get into the Moonstone issues where um, Mawitana has become Fork Town for some reason. Um, no, that's that's a separate, that's another town. Oh, you reckon? Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll try and read it with that in mind. I didn't, didn't see that. But that's okay. All right. So anyway. let's. Okay, so that was an interesting question. Yeah, like, no. Yeah. Let's let's. Should we go over this Moonstone story? Because for a lot of people, they haven't seen it. Or do you want to quickly go through some of these other stories? Oh, no, I, I don't want to get bogged down in going over the same going over the stories um, necessarily. And I know it's a comics review, but I'm conscious of the time as well. Let's go over the Moonstone ones because for a lot of people, this My is the only first time. On, on the rest of the Fork stories would be, A, it was clear that he was really keen to go back to the Eastern Dark well because two of his last three stories were Eastern Dark stories. It was also obvious that he'd started to lose the, the, the skill as an author, you know, to be, to be blunt. I think the last couple of years and those, those last couple of stories, if they weren't in the middle of the annual, you probably wouldn't necessarily want to read them. They, they're, not, they're not great. The con- the concept of the terror one, I thought was okay, was good, and I liked the development of Uncle Dave. 
Yeah, I didn't. I didn't mind that at all. I, but then you know there was so much wrong with that story in terms yeah. of walking around going, "Have you got nuclear materials in a suitcase? Have you got nuclear? Where yeah. where might they be?" You know, it was a bit silly. Yeah. I well, so there's also the there's the um, what do you call it the, the the theory or the story, and don't know quite how true it is that Elizabeth Falk actually finished off that story. Yeah, um, it's a great it's story. Just, She's certainly it's a, credited in, in this book. Yeah. It's a great story. Whether there's any truth in it, I'm not sure. But I think it's safe to say that it wasn't entirely written by Lee Fork in the sense that there's some obvious lack of story, like what you said. You know, it, it was obvious that someone else had kind of written had written or, it. Or, uh, or he's just a, a very old man on his deathbed too who yeah. – to, to nut out his last story and write it down to the wire. And um, yeah. maybe he scripted it and Elizabeth finished the dialogue for him, or, or who knows. But yeah. um, and maybe none of that happened, and maybe it did. It's a great story, and, and no one ever really will know. Um, so I'm happy to go with the myth. Um, it's all good for me. But yeah, you're right. The Moonstone story, um, it was it was the first time I've read it. Um, I don't have a lot of the Moonstone books. So um, do you want to do you want to just flick us through it and, and fill yeah. us in? So, uh, first of all, issue five and six is a, a two-joined cover, which for the Moonstone, obviously you wouldn't have seen it in the annual. Uh, so what you're seeing on YouTube, what we're flicking through is actually a Moonstone uh, scan of it. Can you see that? Yep. So this is what the colours look like uh, in the Moonstone comic. I didn't mind the colouring in the free. I actually thought it did all right. Yeah, I agree. Sometimes it can look a little bit muddy. Uh, muddy is is the term we keep coming back to on this podcast, I suppose. And and there are certainly some of the night scenes, and I'm looking on page 190, 191 in particular, where it all sort of blends into each other a little bit. And I'm sure that's going to be a lot more clear on the uh, yeah uh, the original glossy page Moonstone, which you're flicking through. Um, but it didn't it didn't do it's better than the Lou Manor story, the yes. color print. Um, I'm glad they printed it in colour. Yep. Um, you know, the I like how it kind of goes back. It kind of references some of the the fault stories as well. Um, so here you go. So so we're talking about uh, fault down here. So this is on page. Um, Page 169, first panel. This is Forktown, a small town founded by the English. Um, you know, so it's definitely... Because then on page 168, the second panel, it's down as Moatuan International Airport would like you to, to welcome you yeah, to okay. Bangala. So it is... Forktown is actually a separate little town, which is obviously a little nod to the creators. And... <laughs> If uh, we've done a podcast with Mike Bullock and Ben Rabb, who are both involved in this story, and, um, uh, you know, it's something that both of those type of people would actually take care in in doing that. Um, what do you think about the story? Uh, look, it's, it's pretty dark by the time you get to the end of it and you realise <laughs> why all of these... Uh, why these people are getting stolen at the moment. It's no longer for uh, something as simple as a sex slave trade. Um, yeah. A bit darker than that. Um, and, and then and here's the, sorry, here's the, on YouTube you see the the phantom retelling the slave trade, the, the drugs yeah. and, and, and all that as well. So I do like that. Moonstone was, that was real, Moonstone was really good at trying to connect with the, with the Lee Fork universe. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, no, as a, as a whole, I quite enjoyed the story. Um, yeah, it, it, it probably got a bit weird at the end when they started going super dark and you go, um, there's, a, there's a lot more going on behind the scenes in terms of the organ harvesting and that sort of thing. Mm. Um, and you wonder how deep the conspiracy goes and how many people, how many of the guards know what they're doing and that sort of stuff. Yeah, um, but Moonstone was not afraid of going dark they had they they touched upon drugs they touched upon uh child slavery uh child soldiers sorry um they actually had a whole a, a three-part story on child uh soldiers and then they actually 
the profits, some of the profits from those three stories that were actually uh, published, they actually donated some of the proceeds to actually a charity over in Africa, um, uh, you know, in the fight against child soldiers. And, and Mike talks about that in the podcast that he did with us as well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, organ, organ uh, is, is not a huge, it's nothing too uh, dark from what they, um, they've touched upon. And look, if you if you go and add that to the list of crimes of people from the Eastern Dark across generations, uh, you just get the sense that these are a really nasty nation of people. Yes, <laughs> yes, um, yeah. I, I was really surprised that that Free added this. Um, I love these. I really like the artist. Um, this is I can't pronounce his name. Silvani. Yeah, he he ended up doing quite a few Phantom stories. And his phantom, like a lot of American artists do the whole, you know, walnuts, you know, condom full of walnuts. His is more of a slick, athletic phantom. And I like yeah, it. That. Yeah, because I really like that as well. And um, some of the, the the scenes, and you, you've got a few, couple of them on the screen here, but um, he actually looks really lithe and um, lean and, and, as you say, athletic. Yeah. I like this. This is great storytelling where the Phantom saved the day and now you've got, you know, you've got the sun rising, you've got the, the sun going through the clouds, you've got the birds. It's like peace has kind of come back, you know, to the jungle for the time being, of course. Yes. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I thought uh, this was, this was good, some good storytelling. Um, I like the art um, and I like how Fruit, Fruit did this. Um, did I also read? Uh, I'm just trying to find it. Yeah, I also liked how they included, and I will on bring on 184. Um, so, Ed, for those who have got the Moonstone comics, you would know this, but Ed Rhodes, before he uh, passed away, um, mm-hmm. an absolute amazing man, um, he would do all these little behind the mask which is you know really iconic and all that he would do these just these one page ramblings i guess you can call it um and you just learn so much reading these stories um and yeah i'm really glad that um they included those they were able to include one of them it's interesting you say that because I couldn't understand why it had been included. Um, and I guess if it was in one of the two comics, one of the two Moonstone books, part one or two, that might be explained why it found its way into the yeah. annual. But behind the mask, this one is about music and the Phantom and coincidental connections of the yeah. Phantom and music and the way that some of his creators enjoy playing the piano. And it just seemed, I don't know, it, it just seemed to be out of place for the rest yes. of the rest of the annual was really well themed and then there's this this one page which is just a random yeah it would have been better if through or if through had chosen a better editorial essay piece from ed from ed well Um, the jim shepherd was perfect because it was talking about the eastern dark which is the theme yeah um yeah i i I would have rather if you're going to pinch something else from Moonstone, or sorry, reprint something else from Moonstone, um, maybe one of their covers rather than than this. Yeah, uh, maybe you could have done the uh, two covers joined together. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, if they'd done both covers, they wouldn't have had enough room for the whole of the last story, Return to the Eastern Dark, Shameful Trade, which is the Dan- the, the Duncan Munro Daniel Pachoto. Combination um, working together. The first time we've seen Daniel as a, a story artist. He's yes. been very successful as a cover artist in our annual um, best of comp- um, surveys, um, picking up the last two first places, if I remember rightly. Um, first time we've seen him as a story artist. What do you think of, um, before we talk about the rest of the story, what do you think about Daniel as a, as a story artist? Uh, he's a great talent. Um, through and to lock him down, sign to a long term contract where he's not allowed to do anything else but just fancy stuff. Um, <laughs> chain him to that desk because, um, yeah, he's a I like his phantom, um, I like the storytelling. Um, I reckon he's I reckon he's still got improvement. He's a young, he's young as well. Um, I dare I, I would like to say he's 
still in his 30s, like he's younger than us uh, in his 30s. So I think his best is still to come. Um, hopefully I didn't age him too much and he's still in his 20s. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I really enjoyed uh, I really enjoyed it. And he, he obviously works well in uh, black and white. I would like to see him also in colour as well. Yeah, there's certainly a few scenes, um, and I'm looking at the page, the top of page 212 at the moment, the, where he's delivering a, a red blooded crack uh, to the jaw of a roughneck um, as part of his questioning technique. Um, I think it might be the next page from where you are there, Jim. Uh, yeah, that's it there. So the top there, very, it's a very plain panel. Uh, it'd be interesting to see what colours, how that could make that that pop out. Yeah. Um, I also liked how oh, I can't even remember which which phantom kid, which phantom kid it was. Um, it doesn't actually have a because this is in eighteen oh five, so it doesn't actually say which phantom this is involved. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, but I like how we how he's kind of like the hero where he. Well, he has time to shine. Like, for instance, yeah. he uses the broken mirror to be able to, like, spot when it's coming, knocks out the bad guy, leads the, you know, leads the kids and, and you know, and, and stuff like that. Um, this, this bit here with the, um, the running away wag and, and stuff like that, it got a little bit... Um, it was it was a great action sequence, but I got a little bit like, oh, is this, you know, um, I, I don't know. It was just kind of like I, I'm not sure if, if Duncan lost me in this bit <laughs> or not. Whether he was trying to do too much. Um, I did like this bit where you've got the little uh, the uh, little phantom. He's trying to rip open the cage and saying, you know, doing bringing out his inner defenders of the earth and saying, I have the strength of 10 tigers. And, and, you know, then it was the dad that kind of did it. I did think that was, that was good. Yeah. Now, one thing I want to raise, which you said it in, when you're talking about the DAC, you know, D-A-R-K and D-A-K-K does, um, does, uh, Duncan solve that dilemma by going coastal town of Zal in the D-A-K-K region, the Eastern Dark. Does Duncan solve that Lee Fork dilemma by that opening panel? I think it's I think it's a really clever interpretation. Fits exactly with what we've seen before. And Yes, I think it's a good resolution to to the situation where we go. I always personally, and and the first stories, it's Eastern Dark, D-A-R-K. It's only in the later stories that it becomes D-A-double-K. Maybe I read those ones first because I always liked the idea of it being D-A-double-K. It's a different spelling as well. Um, but I think that the idea that D-A-double-K is the geographical name for the place. Yeah, the Eastern Dark region. The, the idea of this foreign um, foreign yeah. people in the dark regions, and it's a mispronunciation or a, an interpretation of DAWK that um, the people on the west have made, I suppose. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah, so maybe um, maybe Duncan realised the same thing when he was uh, doing his research on this, and he does like the eastern side of Bangalore. He's done a few stories with uh, the Misty Mountains, and now. Nowadays. Now, all right, here's a question. So we just talk. I just made mention of the the eastern side of things. Where does the eastern dark or the eastern D A K K? Where does that fit? Is it Bengala, the Misty Mountains, and then the eastern dark, or is the eastern dark part of the Misty Mountains? Oh, I see. I would have always thought that eastern dark was on the other side of the Misty Mountains. Okay. And, and certainly one of the, yeah. the the Williams stories, which I probably didn't enjoy as much. The as, Dak Pirates talks about that. Where yeah, has them coming through. And, and maybe that, maybe again, maybe that's one of the first ones I read when uh, yeah. I was... So it's definitely across the mountains. But I guess the question is, is, is the mountains part of the Eastern Dark? 
or is the or is the dark region even further beyond yes, the mountains? I think even further. Yeah. Yep. All right, cool. Now, where does the slave market of uh, or the new car? Where does that fit? Is that in that region? Uh, that's more west. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, yeah. Should we move on then? Work on a map at one stage, and and we. We went through, and uh, you, I think, did a lot of the translating of the uh, the um, Oscan Erlap map from the nineteen eighties from Team Phantom and putting English names on it. And then we we spent a bit of time at the at the time speculating. Well, outside the boundaries of that map, what's over here? What's over there? How can we put this all together? So uh, we really must go back to that at some time. So yeah, well, we've got an article that's three quarters written, basically, of the countries around Bengala. Um, yeah, yeah, so, and it, yeah. but so if we if we're going to go international uh, with what's with what's beyond the boundaries of Bengala, let's let's try and get a segue out of this. Uh, what's <laughs> behind beyond the boundaries of Bengala? Well, Brazil certainly is. And if you're wondering what the segue is, that's because the next issue we're going to talk about is giant size phantom number nineteen, uh, which is a Brazil special, which I thought was a really cool concept. Mm, I um, love the concept. And, and backing the concept up big time is the cover. And again, Glenn Lumsden, he's come up a number of times with covers over this little period. Um, I really love the cover uh, that pictures the Phantom parachuting down into Brazil past the big Jesus statue, turning red as he goes because that's the colour of the Phantom in Brazil. And uh, down beneath him are all of the rest of the characters from the Fruniverse, um, Phantom Ranger, Sir Phantom, The Shadow. Um, and we've got a collection of... Brazilian stories. All of these phantoms, obviously, American creation that we pretend is Australian, but the rest are Australian creations, and uh, they're all stories that have been picked up and, and uh, written in Brazil. Um, what were your thoughts on the idea of, um, you know, this concept of giant size phantom for a start? It's, it's like a, a cross between um, uh, giant size and phantom's world. Yeah. Um, I love it. I love it. It's very clever. Um, I love the editorial piece by Neville C. Bain, um, who I believe is actually an Australian. Yep. Um, but it's 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 there's care shown in this to be able to because it's a lot easier just to be able to sh chuck in a, a Charlton issue, um, you know, and you know, and some true stories that they've kind of got. But there's care put in with this story. You've got a, a cover that drip that is dripping in theme. It's like you look at this, you know yeah. it's Brazil. Um, I'll bet you there's plenty of Brazilian Phantom fans or, or uh, Brazilian comic fans that are going to be picking this up. You know, this will probably. I will not be surprised if this becomes one of Fru's best-selling giant size uh, issues. Um, so they're going to get extra sales out of this theme. You know, all these stories would have had to be translated. Um, are the stories any good though? Uh, in my opinion, no. But <laughs> <laughs> um, I have flicked through the not phantom stories enough to appreciate the fact that they must have been translated. You can tell through the lettering and that sort of thing that it's not uh, the original. Um, the other than that, they don't look greatly different to the giant size stories because I haven't read a lot of those. Um, other non phantom characters as well. The the phantom story I did read, the kidnapping of Garan. Um, look, the artist was clearly really heavily inspired by Cy Barry. Mm. And to be fair, it, and the Sparta and the Sparta creators. Yep, yep. Um, there's some there's some panels that are an absolute dead set. Uh, knock off or swipe for one of a better term. Um, so if I look on the bottom of page 10, uh, the Phantom, where am I? I've got the, haven't got that on camera. The, yeah, bottom of page 10, Phantom on Hero. Uh, that is a dead set classic side yeah. barrier panel. Um, and there's a, there's two or three of those, a couple involving Diana. Um, the artist yeah. is not side Barry and, and, you know, no one is. Yeah. Look, that, that picture of the Phantoms with his face, look, that needs to be redrawn. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, in saying that, there's there's good panels, there's bad panels. Um, yeah. I've got some original uh, Sparta artwork, and you know Diana looks like something that uh, Germano Ferry uh, did. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of panels in here that 
yeah, that are not only from Siberia but also from Sparta. And, but yeah, the story is average. But yeah, the story is average. The, the Phantom gets hit on the head twice. Um, so Steve would absolutely love that. And, and, that's, and that's the real reason why we didn't allow Stephen on the podcast because he would spend the next 10 minutes talking about it. Um, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Look, while, even though the stories are average, and in saying that, the, the other stories of like Sir Falcon, the Shadow, and the Phantom Ranger, they're the same quality as what Fru were producing in the 1950s. Um, but even though the story was average, I enjoyed getting to be able to a, a peek behind the curtain, to be able to learn about the RGE team, learn about these stories, especially in the essay that was written by, by Neville. Um, from a, a curiosity point of view, I enjoyed the story. And, you know, for 10 bucks, me personally, maybe not for everyone, but it was $10 worth spent. For me, it's ten dollars well spent just for the cover. To be honest, I, I would, um, yeah, I'm really happy to have a copy of that that I can pull out and have a look at any time I want and to, to spend. And then when it. and then when Glenn comes to uh, Supernova, he can uh, sign it for us. <laughs> He's left himself plenty of white space for a good clear signature. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but do you think like Glenn would only do it in grey pen, in a grey sparkly pen? Probably. <laughs> he, he'll be absolutely chuffed if we're going to go back to the corner box that his phantom is <laughs> on the front cover of every phantom. <laughs> yeah. But uh, look, yeah, I enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. Um, now, it's, a, it's been too long to get here, but we're going to talk about uh, the second graphic novel. This has also come out through January, uh, The Phantom, The Ghost and the Monster. Uh, both of uh, Jermaine and I have already reviewed this for a YouTube video, so I thoroughly recommend you get along and uh, watch that. I don't want to repeat myself verbatim from what was said there or anything, Germ. We want to um, extend on, on what we said there, so go and have a look at that. Um, we've already had a bit of a chat about these things, but... Um, well, I've got a couple of questions I'd like okay. to ask you. Um, you may mention that you didn't mind the cover. Me personally, I said that the cover was a weakness because it wasn't, it was just plain and I didn't like the, the two tone background and stuff like that. I said that I would have liked having, you know, the monster Frankenstein, you know, like strangling the phantom or something action or something like that. Um, that's what I personally think. Uh, but you're happy with this type of cover? Yeah, I think that um, the fact that you showed the two generations of Phantom, that was probably what helped me, um, you know, appreciate this, is that you could see, okay, we've got our modern Phantom, you've got the older Phantom as well, um, and then the, the, the monster sort of walking between both of those worlds. So, you know, I was happy enough with it. Would have you liked to see more of the past Phantom? than just, what, it would have been three or four pages? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think now as I went through. I, I sort of felt like that. Um, I thought it was an odd an odd sort of a story motif, that the, the, the ripped pages out of the Chronicle, that sort of indicated. I didn't mind that. Yeah, I, probably what jarred for me there is when the uh, when Frankenstein's monster pulled out the three pages from his inside his jacket pocket, and they'd somehow been miraculously fine, even though he'd walked a kilometre underneath the ocean. <laughs> um, that, that that jumped out to me as soon as he pulled them out, um, and so maybe that, that coloured my my vision of that one. Um, yeah, no, I, it probably would have been good to see more of the past fandom. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because the the previous the graphic previous, novel, yeah. Khalif was also bouncing back and forward between a couple of generations of Phantom. I think sort of Khalif probably did that. Well, certainly did it more extensively. Mm. Um, I think it did it well. I would have, yeah. So for me personally, I like that concept. I still think it could have been signposted a little bit better with the little bubbles and stuff like that. Um, but I think, yeah, I would have liked to have seen more of the 17th or the 18th Phantom, I can't remember, and Frankenstein. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, look, I, th I thought that the, the scenes where that phantom, and you're right, I can't remember off the top of my head, whether it was 17 or 18, where the two of them were um, going through London trying to clean up and Frankenstein's monster just lost the plot um, when he came across a, a particularly bad bunch of guys who deserved what they got, but it was a, a, a graphic scene nonetheless. 
was the 17th Phantom, just for the record, yeah. which yeah. you can find about on page 14. Now, another question: the monster theme. I'm not a monster. I'm not a monster man. I don't enjoy monster movies. Um, you know, I've don't really pref- don't really like uh, what would you call it fantasy elements too much. Now, I think. Andrew towed that line well enough that even me who don't doesn't like monster themes still found reasons to enjoy this story. What about you? I liked the bulk of the story. It probably lost me a bit when Frankenstein himself came back. And no spoilers, you hopefully most people have read this by now. Um the the second the, the the actual bad guy as it turns out him turning up um that's probably when the story started to yep. lose me. yep now for me i had three issues with the elements that i think uh andrew and glenn should have not included um and that was and i am going to do spoilers so if you haven't read it yet quick press pause or skip for the next two minutes. But I didn't like the jail. Did not like the jail scene. Uh, I did not like the drinking of the potion. And I did not like that the monster knew that the phantom secret that he was immortal. And we've both made mention of that in our podcast. Mm. Now, the other three elements that kind of ruined the story for me because that's not... Ha- drinking the potion, that's not my phantom. Um, having a jail where he has illegally imprisoned someone without dr- without due process, that's not my phantom. My phantom captures him and then hands him off to jungle justice or to the city. And then not every Tom, Dick and Harry and Frankenstein should know that the phantom passes his legacy down from father to son, father to son, because that's the whole point of the phantom is that he is the ghost who walks, the man who cannot die. Probably that last one is the only one that I could find any justification for to be to be better. Like, if you're going to accept that Frankenstein's monster exists and is virtually immortal and has met a couple of fandoms, then, uh, you know, I'm okay-ish enough with, you know, if you're going to accept Frankenstein's monster, he can know the fandom secret. He's not going to tell anybody who's going to want to listen to him. Um, it's the other two elements, like the fandom running into the into the middle of the battle hasn't doesn't even really know what the potion's all about and, and just sort of yeah I'll scull that and see what happens that yeah. didn't make any sense how did he know it was going to work how did he know it was going to wear off all of that sort of stuff um, mm. he would have had to listen at that window for a long long time before he understood all of that I, I, I'm not buying that one um, but the 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 jail in the back of the skull cave was that was the worst part of it for mine. That made no sense. That's never been a thing in the Phantom ever. Um, yeah, that. Yeah, I'm with you on that yeah. one. Okay. End of major plot spoilers. I liked how Andrew uh, did Diana. I thought Diana was 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 good. She yes, she still got kidnapped, which we kind of expect in every story that features Diana, but there was times when she showed her true self, which was the Diana that, you know, let's face it, most most of us men fell in love with as a teenager, you know, where she kicked butt, where she was able to look after herself, where, you know, at, at, yeah. she even almost protected the phantom as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. When she steps out of the skull cave with the rifle, um, yeah, that that's her going, I'm not, I'm not letting this just happen. I'm not going to yeah. cower in the back of the cave and wait and see what happens. I'm getting involved and I'm helping. Um, and then the compassion, obviously, yeah. those elements from her um, rang really true. So um, there, there's lots to like about this. It was just those yeah. couple of things we just mentioned there before that sort of were like, uh, yeah. Um, I, I really en- I, I enjoy the art and I enjoy the colour from um, father-daughter uh, combo Is combination. It? Yes. Uh, really enjoy their work together. Um, all right, all right. One more question: How often should free create graphic novels? Oh, look, as often as they can. Um, I'd love it if they were able to to you know throw one of these out every year. Um, yep. That'd be fantastic. 
Um, I, I can only expect that it's a huge undertaking on top of all of the other um, balls yeah. they've got in the air at any given time. Um, yeah. I, I wouldn't mind... I, I enjoy Giancarlo's art as well. Probably would like to see a new artist for the third graphic novel. I, I wouldn't like to think... Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I just think if we have a third graphic novel that's also by Giancarlo, then suddenly graphic He's novels are where yeah. we see Giancarlo. You know? So I'd like to yeah. see him maybe get a, a story uh, of a regular issue um, and, and someone else gets the graphic novel. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And, and I guess if you have other creative teams, you can produce one once yeah. a year. Um, just one quick point. Uh, I'm not sure if any eagle-eyed people noticed this, but this was not printed in Australia. Um, like, unlike most other uh, regular issues and trade paperbacks and the first graphic novel. So uh, that's an interesting little development on that one. Um, look, I'm the same as you. Once a year, I would like to see a graphic novel. Um, and then I would like to see two trade paperbacks a year as well. And I've said it before, I could live with no annual if we got two good trade paperbacks and a graphic novel. It's an interesting one because at the end of the day, what's the difference really between this annual yeah. and a trade paperback? Yeah. Um, the, a, trade, a good trade paperback, we've seen those, are the ones collected around a theme. Um, yeah. the, the difference is, I guess, uh, the trade paperbacks have got better quick print quality and better, pa better paper quality. And in uh, colour. And in colour. And, yeah, have been entirely in colour, which would be a huge undertaking to colour. Yeah. Uh, although, though it depends if they can get access to colour proofs of, um, yeah. of the Sunday and, and daily stories. Um, yeah, I, I think there's a – yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. If you were going to start through from scratch, and this is probably a different – um, a different podcast, different podcast. A different for a different podcast, but um, and maybe we do, you know, look at this for two fifteen or something. If you're going to start an Australian publishing company, if you're going to start through from scratch today, how would you set up your production schedule? Mm. Um, it, it's a, it's an interesting one. I, I still like the annual. Um, yeah, look, I, I love the annual as well. I really do. There's the whole nostalgic point of view. I remember my first annual that I ever read. That I brought was uh, one one two five. Um, I skipped the birthday party so I can read it. It was my sister's birthday party, so I didn't you know I didn't really count. I was just stupid <laughs> little girls running around. Um, you know, I, I still got the food and the uh, and the lolly bag, so I was all good with that. Uh, just meant I didn't have to play with girls, um, <laughs> which as any teen, you know, little I would have been twelve then. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I still remember annual. I've had some great memories reading annuals. I enjoyed this annual. But I just think that, you know, I think trade paperbacks and graphic novels, Fru has to get into that market properly and they have to nail that market. Mm. Um, now, look, we've said it a number of times and uh, the, the information from my local comic book store is that the, the trade paperbacks fly off the shelf when they come in. So I'm yeah. sure Fru are seeing this, the figures and I'm sure that they're crunching numbers and going, well, this is, what, this is what pays bills and this is where there's potential future growth and that sort of stuff. It would be fascinating to know what all of that is and that, uh, we can just sort of speculate and, go and, and, and say what we think is going to work. Um, I, yeah. The, the, the way that the annuals are being put together at the moment, as I say, very much like a trade paperback anyway. Um, it would be interesting to know if, they, if yeah. they just repackaged that exact same thing, called it a trade paperback and sold it in those stores, would, the, would it, you know, fly as far? I wonder if um, uh, being printed in outside of Australia uh, keeps the, um, especially like trade paperbacks, graphic novels and stuff, because she could do because an extra week delay, which let's face it, does happen when you're shipping okay. stuff from, uh, you know, when when you're doing that with that, whether the cheaper costs does make it more viable to be able to do two trade paperbacks and a graphic novel every year. Yeah, it would have to, but it's all it's also obviously an editor's time, um, and uh, Glenn can only do oversee so much in a, in a week, I suppose, and Dudley, uh, you know, putting things together, it's a they're still just a small crew at the end of the day and, and um, pumping out all of these books. They do a fantastic job as it is. Yeah. So I think, Dan, I think that's all our free stuff that we have yet, uh, that we have to review. 
It is. It actually, it's probably less than I would have thought for a two-month gap, but there's been a lot of, uh, not so many issues, but certainly a lot of stories. So mm. um, anyway, let's get, we need to keep going around the world now and see what else is going on. So we're going to hear from us. Was this, is this the, the review I put up on YouTube? We're just going <laughs> to, is that what you were doing? <laughs> yep. <Yes. laughs> All right. So I've got a run sheet and it's, <laughs> you can edit this together however you like, mate. <laughs> so um, we're going to have a quick look at the Hermes DC book, uh, the the volume one that collected those first four issues of, uh, sorry, first six story. Uh, it's complicated. I'll explain it in the video that you're about to see. <laughs> and after that, we'll go around the world to people who actually know what they're talking about. Mikel's going to take us through what's been going on in Sweden in particular. Armkit's going to review Shakti and Regal for us. Um, and, and he's got some skin in the game because he's doing some fantastic work with those guys as well at the moment. So I'll hand over to all of them. Today, we are looking at the Hermes Press volume, The Phantom, the complete DC Comics volume one. So this is the hardcover that came out in uh, 2021, late 2021, um, which gathers, as it suggests, the DC Comics from the 1980s. 1988, uh, DC Comics put out a four-parter, and in 1989, they started a 12-part series of The Phantom. This gathers the first uh, four stories from the four-parter, and then the first two stories um, from the Luke McDonald and Mark Verheiden series. But um, Predominantly, we're looking at the Joe Orlando and Dave Gibbons um, stories with Peter David, obviously, on the writing. Um, that's the original cover from the first of the four-parter. And um, because uh, I really like this, we've got the... Uh, the um, poster, the original advertising poster there, that's pretty cool. Um, we've got a bit of an introduction, and because Peter David was the author, uh, we of course have got an interview with him to begin it. Um, and in typical Hermes Press, Press fashion, that's pretty much a transcription of a conversation between Dan Herman, the publisher, and Peter David. And we go through and we see uh, the entire the entire interview with him, which is really insightful and great reading to hear what Peter David. Um, has to say, then we have a, uh, a, a short um, essay on Joe Orlando, who of course is the uh, the pencil artist for the four-parter DC Phantom. Now, this is the, uh, as we flick through it, this is the start of the uh, the first comic. What you'll notice is it's a nice clean version of the uh, of the cover, by which I mean it doesn't have the DC logo up in the top corner and that sort of thing. I don't actually have a copy of DC number one, but that's an example of what the cover of DC number seven in the series looked like. So just obviously that bit, that stuff's missing from up in the top corner there with regard to the cover. Um, then as we go through, nice glossy pages as you can see, um, probably a little bit too glossy in this light, just tip it up a little bit perhaps, um, so you can see the, the, the quality of the paper there and the quality of the, uh, the colour, which is uh, really, really cool, stands out for me. Um, some people have asked about the, uh, the double page spreads because just when you look at the... When you look at it open like that, you can see a white boundary or border around each page. And so for instance, a double page spread uh, might look like this one here on page 25. So we really sort of kind of saw that as we flicked past. Now that's, a, as you can see, obviously one big image that's split by a pretty ugly white bar when it comes to this is, this issue. Um, again, by way of comparison, I suppose that's what it uh, could look like. And there's obviously not double spreads, um, those pages, but you can see that the color goes, or the the colouring goes right to the the bit or the edge of the page in those. So that's lost a little bit when it comes to the Hermes Press version. But I guess what I would say about that, and, and again, I don't actually have the original of any of the six comics in that have been gathered in this trade paperback. Um, so I can't give you a side by side, which is unfortunate, but that's part of the reason why I really like having the trade paperback is to read books that I haven't had access to. I guess by way of comparison with the colours, and again, perhaps with the light, it's a little bit difficult. But um, these are a little bit more dull, I suppose, as opposed to the brighter colours, as you would expect with the, the quality that Hermes Press bring in terms of the paper quality in particular. It's a glossy print, and so the colours are not a lot brighter and all the rest of it. And that, I guess, comes back to personal choice as to which you prefer, um, whether you you like the, uh, the muddier style. Um, and muddy is an unfair term, but the, the, the more matte style of, uh, of the originals. Um, 
some of the things that of interest here so if we have a look at uh, for instance the end of the and as, you, as i was flipping through this original uh, version you can see that there are letter pages and so those have come across however every time i've gone through this and it's straight away it opens up onto advertisements and that sort of thing um, those ads do not make their way into the the final uh, into the Hermes press gathering and even the back cover is ads for on all of the issues that I've got so presumably for the first six years as well so we just go straight we flip the page and go straight into the next story um, or the next issue with again one of those um, naked covers uh, really clear covers which uh, makes for a nice um, title page I suppose as you as you work through the trade paperback um, perhaps a little criticism I might have in that regard, and it's a minor one only, I suppose, but if we get to, where are we? It was around here. So yeah, this is the, uh, nope, go back a little, go back. Must be on 25. Yeah, so this is the end of the four part story um and spoilers <laughs> um but that's the end of the the four part story and just in by the way the way it finishes it off so that's clearly a um clearly what well, doesn't say the end but it's um it's wraps up pretty clearly um and then we flip straight into part one of the 12 part series so it might have been nice to have a little bit more of a distinction between that or a little bit of a gap um somehow to do identify that we're into a new arc um as much as anything um as i flip past them i'm reminded that uh, we don't have the the, the skulls in the uh, inside covers there that we have seen in past Hermes Press. So if I bring up the Don Newton one, these skulls on the inside pages there were pretty common um, in terms of what Hermes have done before. Um, consistent in that regard there, I suppose. But um, anyway, um, just, a, just a point of note that that is a little bit different. Look, the quality of the book, we know it's Hermes Press, we know it's gonna be good quality, um, really good strong hardcover. Um, the the information it gives you in the blurb the artwork um is really really well done now one thing i would like to say just while i'm you know not just reviewing the book but actually um as i suggested there before this is the first time i've actually read um, myself any of these 1980s american comics um because i probably haven't tried hard enough to to collect them to be honest but as i say i have picked up a a few of the the later issues seven eight nine and twelve i think um i actually do own um so for me it was really nice to actually read these stories which i haven't read before and a lot of people have raved about and i can certainly see why um it's a it's a it's an entertaining read um and um does some things with the story arc in terms of like rex is the is the Kit and Heloise type figure in this one, I suppose, which is an interesting choice because Kit and Heloise were certainly around by 1988, but um, the, uh, Peter David's chosen to use um, to choose Rex, which is cool. Um, and the way he's reading the, the, the Chronicles and that sort of thing is a nice plot device. Um, a criticism might be that I find the, um, the font for the Chronicles a little bit hard to read. And actually, certainly by comparison with the, uh, the dialogue boxes for um the main story i did and as i was reading this i found myself skipping over these a little bit rather and letting letting the story tell the art rather than trying to read the words which um is probably a bit of a shame when it comes to the the narrative um certainly the depictions of violence um in these sorts of in this american version is um a bit more full-on than probably this australian used to read is used to reading um in terms of the way that uh, some of the stuff has been depicted there's a there's a murder of a jungle patrolman there's a a, a rape or an alleged rape or a, a setup of a rape anyway a um and a suicide that all happens and, and largely graphically depicted um which i guess is just a different type of style than uh, than what i might otherwise be used to so um, on the whole, though, really enjoyed reading the stories and glad that I had access to them and really glad that I had access to them in such a good quality, um, in such a good quality book. So uh, The Phantom, The Complete DC Comics Volume 1, um, absolutely recommend you get a hold of it. Welcome for another Phantom Review. This time it's 2022, issue number one. So we are a bit in the future since my clock says it's still not Christmas. This issue has a cover by Luca Arbata with all of these frogs and snakes attacking the phantom. Looks pretty cool. And as the first issue of the year, let's see what it holds. First off, we have some editorial uh, information. 
and we also get uh, information about what's going to happen in this new year 2022 from Jacob and Andreas. So we will, they will try to have something new in every issue that hasn't been published in Phantomen earlier. So either a new Team Phantomen story, a newspaper story or something from Fru. So that's great. And uh, they also say that uh, the Phantom will come to Sweden again, but not Stockholm, but somewhere where people from Stockholm go to when it's vacation time. And there will be the two last uh, stories by Klaus Remarti and uh, some new and old creators coming back. So that sounds good. There will be some uh, reruns and for like for this issue and this next issue we will have some Hans Lindahl and that's great. I love Hans Lindahl. They will continue doing some things in black and white and some in color. Everyone knows I love color more, but I guess I have to live with that. New side stories uh, or side comics. So the things that isn't fun the Phantom in Phantomen it will be three, three new and some old ones that we have seen before. And then there will be a new Christmas album and a new softcover album, but those are usually in the Q3, Q4, and there will be some new. And I think Andreas have been uh, talking about this in the interview we did with the Chronicle Chamber, so I think he talks a, a bit about this then. So check that out if you haven't done that. Then the main story is actually a rerun. It is the Hans Lindahl, but it's written by Don Avenel. The Magic Flute, it's from 95. I think it was in uh, Fru 1138, if I'm not misremembering. And it's about how this, the flute from, uh, with, with the story with the rats and then the kids came into the Phantom's possession. I like this because you, usually the stories where uh, Tim Phantomen writes about uh, these uh, artifacts in the treasure chamber comes. It's usually just a story and then in the end he gets the, the actual thing. But here it plays a big role in the story and it's used quite a lot. So I, I think that's... I mean I, I usually don't like things you can't explain but yeah I think it's really done very well in the story I, I enjoyed it very much then we have the new thing in this issue and that is from Fru it's the Duncan Monroe story with art by Jeff Wiegel it's uh, hold, held to account so it's the flame part two and uh, Australian readers know a lot about this and it's great to see and it's it's like Empire Strikes Back. It's a it's a really interesting uh, continuation from a great first story, and it promises a conclusion, but it's still very good on its own. Then we have this uh, with all the all the Phantomen when they come out during the year, and the really really nice part they have done this year. It's two sided so we get one one side with no dates at all and just the uh, image that is so so great I love I love that innovation what's more nothing more except information about the next issue so it will be the third part of the Duncan Rose trilogy uh, Rotten Apples there will be a rerun the Rasputin's Rebus and a rerun by Hans Lindahl, the poison maker with the Guran here. So that's something to look forward to and we will also be able to vote for the best adventure of 2021. This time it is issue 2-3 of 2022. I really love this cover done by Henrik Sahlström. It's uh, connecting to Rotten Apples uh, with art by Jeff Wiegel and written by Duncan Monroe. It was first published in Fru 1896. 
Uh, whom uh, Duncan Monroe gets an introduction on the editorial page. Uh, there is also a notice about Andreas reading Chronicle Chamber to get the info needed for this. And uh, that seems like a good uh, web page. You should check that out. So, the main story, Rotten Apples, ties up uh, the threads from the two earlier, the Hero Complex and Held to Account. I think it's a great story in, uh, yeah, I'm not all always uh, like in every single way it's a great story then we have a reprint of the poison maker uh, with story and art by Hans Lindahl it was first published in uh, Phantom and 14 2004 and later in through 1388 and I want to say that I really enjoy these modern reprints so much more than the old uh, Williamson Eralp from the 60s. Uh, yeah, uh, even though this one was pretty close to memory to me, I, I remembered all of it, basically. Uh, it's a bandar that comes back to the bandar village after living in the city for some time. And uh, then he starts plotting how to get rid of Guran and take him his place. After that story, there is a page about how to vote for the best uh, story of 2021. And we have uh, created a page on Chronicle Chamber that the link should be in the show notes uh, where you can go and vote uh, wherever you are in the world, if you have read the stories, of course. And after that, there's another reprint. It's uh, Rasputin's Puzzle, written by E.D. Carelli and art by Georges Bess. This was published in through 878 and uh, 1705 and in Phantom 17, 1986. In my opinion, the story is very close to the Avon novel uh, The Vampires and the Witch, uh, with the whole town being afraid of these vampire things but this one has uh, its own twists and turns after the initial setup and uh, hold up what time is it it's time for another phantom review with me Mikael this time it's issue 4 of 2022 with this pretty cool iconic cover by the talented Henrik Sahlström this is the 7th Issue number 1700 since the start in 1950. So it's still a shy of through numbers, but uh, it's quite huge milestone. So this issue features two phantom stories. Uh, the Jungle Trek, uh, the daily from 2006 that has not been published in a comic book in Sweden earlier. Written by Tony De Paul and drawn by Paul Ryan. The twins are growing up. And the Phantom wants to see if they can manage different things in the jungle. For me, this is around the time, uh, at least in my opinion, that the daily stories really started to get good after a long, uh, more mediocre period. Uh, and uh, the second story is a reprint. It's written by uh, Ulf Granberg and Öskan Eralp. And Öskan Eralp also did the art. It's... Uh, it was first published in 1977 in Sweden and it has never been published in English. The title is uh, The Witch and it's quite boring and it's also in black and white. But when I look past all of that, it's uh, quite a decent story. And except for those things, there is also this in memorial text of uh, Germano Ferry. Uh, who has done quite a lot of phantom work. Uh, that before he sadly passed away uh, and uh, what else is there yeah the next issue will have a new Tim Fantoma story both written and art by Johan Boy Bo it's really I don't know how to pronounce it Boix Onskans uh, totem that is like the evil totem or the totem of evil would be even more correct and then it's a Falkenberry classic the terrorists so uh, looking forward to that see you next time happy phantoming I am Ankit and today I'll be reviewing Shakti comics from India's the phantom issue number two 
सो एज वी ऑल नो शक्ति कॉमिक्स और प्रॉब्ली इफ यू हैव फॉलोड द न्यूज शक्ति कॉमिक्स इज द सेकेंड पब्लिशर फ्रॉम इंडिया राइट नाउ हु हैव द लाइसेंस टू पब्लिश फैंटम इन इंग्लिश एंड दे हैव द एडिशनल लैंग्वेजेज ऑफ बेंगोली एंड हिंदी सो दिस इज देयर सेकेंड इशू एंड देयर फर्स्ट इशू केम आउट अराउंड अक्टूबर एंड दिस इज इट सो and it it was a very and if you remember and if seen our old review it was a very high quality book in terms of production and all but had some very niggling issues which uh, i am very happy to tell you that they have like you know addressed it and they have done things for the better uh before we begin uh, let's just go into dimensions i just want to mention this thing that the book is slightly smaller if you notice from the previous issue like about like uh, i have measured it it's about like 0.5 less on the width and about 0.3 less uh, on the top so it's like about the the previous issue was i think about 17.5 20.3 or something like that and this is just exactly 17 into 23 or something like that uh but yeah the more detailed of these dimensions and all is written in the written review for the chronicle chamber website you can go check it out so yeah initially that but uh, the rest of the stuff uh, the way they handle production is pretty much the same so you get like the uh, glue binding or perfect binding as they call it or no staples and uh, you get glossy inside pages and a laminated uh, soft cover for this which is pretty much the really good things about the very first issue anyway so yeah as we said uh, this uh, book came out in the languages of uh, bengali and uh, hindi along with english and this time uh, shakti what also announced that they will be doing variant covers so there is a variant cover uh, for it which is the option here but these variant covers are only exclusive for like the bengali and the hindi version so you get uh, two v- types of covers the content is the same but only in bengali and hindi do you have this option so for that i just uh, like to mention this that uh, in these covers like the standard edition cover which comes across three languages is done by me and uh, the variant Uh, cover which comes in bengali and hindi is done by mr anupam singha who is like a legend in the indian comics uh, hindi comics industry as you know the he's like the artist on nagraj and the creator of super commando dhruv and he was the one who did uh, the art on the first issue too uh, so yeah he uh, he did the penciling this on on this i did the inks and uh, and the colors so yeah so yeah so if you want the variant it's only available to read on bengali and hindi so now we come to the issue so those of you remember uh, i i just wanted to go back to the first issue that uh, the first issue was considered a very good uh, book in terms of its production core values and everything but it had some major issues that we felt that and we pointed out like you know there were there was panel uh, stretching involved there was st- there, there was a loss of panels to here like loss of story panels the way the way the editing was done then they had changed the font of the you know of the actual in our words so that also got misprints and typos on it Uh, so yeah means basically it was probably done to give it more of a larger art comic book feel like you know like a graphic novel more than like a strip reprint but uh, uh, it kind of did not work out so because especially in some of the pages where they did go on a four like a per day four strips per page thing it looked much tighter and nicer uh, like here So yeah so what they did this time I'm happy to say is like Shakti had decided not to go into all of it and uh, they've gone straight to like how a classic strip is pre- printed by most com- uh, most publishers you know like one strip or uh, like four strips per uh, page and it and the results are remarkable so there's no panel stretching no nothing and looks great oh another thing so this book comes with a freebie poster of the art as done by me for it's a nice poster nice nice piece of paper 
but yeah this poster is only available if you order directly from for those who had actually pre-ordered the books when it was first announced or via their retailers and uh, even now i think you can get this poster with the retailers for like whatever pre-orders they have placed they get a poster free with it uh, or else you have to order directly from shakti's website you get a poster with each book with it irrespective of its its english or uh, bengali or hindi so yeah but the poster is the same no different for languages so uh, let's go over the book so the book opens up with the credits here and is the same um, design style that they went with the first book and has the graphic the way the story so this yeah the story is the phantom lion it's a tony de paul and paul ryan art story and as, as you can see like i i'm a big fan everybody knows of paul ryan's work and also i'm really glad to see you know paul ryan's art come to shakti also they had uh, originally the first uh, story they had printed in the first, previous issue was mike manley art and yeah so like now it's it's paul ryan being showcased so that's pretty good and and then I, those who have read the story already know what it is but uh, the presentation and the production and oh yeah so this gives you the end of this book which has uh, this from the standard where uh, gives you the inked uh, version that i did for on the pencils of uh, mr anupam sinha so as, as the cover you know company uh, there was another art by another very famous old uh, artist who worked on indrajal covers and all hussein zamin zaidi ji and his this is his artwork for this story and this is the colored version that i did yeah so uh, for the extras on the ones which have the anupam ji's art it has the same inked version picture of this but the colored version of that art is replaced by the standard uh, versions art here so yeah uh, the price of this book is uh, 200 rupees and uh, it is uh, again like it's it's fantastic production no doubt about it i i would even go out on a limb and say that the the amount of uh, like you no know, the kind of work that has been done on this issue is at is like at par with like how they do on trade paperbacks i mean and those who have seen and uh, how much i you know say like everybody knows those who have owned it like you know if anybody's owned regals uh comics they they are also very high quality production but i'd say that this one is even higher but the 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 thing is this is pretty much the same price as a regal issue but it has one story regal prints this with two stories so yeah so it's a trade off but yeah definitely this is the highest quality like phantom comic that's coming out from india for sure definitely so yeah uh, go check it out if you i'm pretty sure fru will uh, stock some on their website at the prices or the best case you uh, you know befriend a uh, indian fan and you know have them uh, you know send you a copy or something like that or exchange copies with him so yeah this is a must uh, buy issue i would say landmark like i know this story has been reprinted by both fru and uh, phantom and phantom and has actually reprinted it much recently in the last couple of years i would say in terms of just the product and the way it's presented it's really really like i i i, I won't I I don't have any other I I don't know whether these uh, dailies will ever see print in better production to be honest yeah and today I'll be reviewing Regal Comics from India's issues number 19 20 and 21 they are the christmas editions of 2021 so yeah they are out in december and I I guess they've just started shipping and here they are uh for those of you who've been checking out our channel and uh, seeing the reviews of these books i can just tell you that it is just the same of the good 
stuff that they've been doing for a long time which is great paper quality great production quality and two stories in full color in all the books with some uh, supplements free supplements so we'll uh, start off with each of the issues and take it from there so first is issue number 19 and it's got uh, the cover art is by Mr. Vincent Moses Raja, whom a lot of you might uh, not remember. He's a veteran and he's been doing the regal covers from issue one itself. And uh, it's uh, taken from the story like it's a, it, it's based off the story, The Forbidden Lands by Graham Nolan, which is the very first story. And it comes with a, a cutout card of the cover art, which you can see here. Uh, yeah, so yeah, the first story is the Forbidden Lands, which is uh, I guess the last uh, Graham Nolan Sunday or the Phantom. Uh, to me, it, it's a very unique kind of a story. I, I it, it's very unique. It's it's got a little esoteric vibe, and it's been uh, very beautifully reprinted by Regal as usual. Very good printing job, great print fidelity. All the stuff is really good. Nice, nice color reproduction, and the new thing is we have a Jeff Weigel story for the first time and it is none other than the little detective who disappeared so this is the second uh, Sunday and it's a Jeff Weigel Sunday and it's a very very nice story too and you can see as usual the print quality and the colors is very well done this is also a very uh, very focused story in my opinion and I quite like it and Jeff Weigel's Phantom uh, was is also pretty unique for him and this is one of his uh, I think initial stories when he was uh, when he just came in and after Terry Beatty and yeah I quite like it so yeah that's about it for issue number 19 issue 20 has got a uh, cover art by Avilash Chako and this is based off Trouble in the Twelve Nations story which has appearances by Mandrake, Lothar and of course Hojo. So it is a, another crossover story. So uh, Terry Beatty did write another, uh, was also the artist on one of the crossover stories uh, which I guess was Mandrake's Bon Voyage or uh, yeah. And this one again, I, I actually prefer this story to Mandrake's Bon Voyage. There's actually, oh, uh, before I go in, the supplement that comes with this is a phantom uh, stamp which is again based off the cover art of the phantom here so yeah so, so yeah so trouble in the 12 nations it's a really nice story it's got uh, Lothar Monar and <clears throat> so all of these guys and it, it's a really really well paced and really nice it's got the humor it's got everything and it's got Hojo and uh, little cameos by Mandrake and all and it, it's a really really nice story really well done for those who love mandrake and are familiar with the characters they will really enjoy it and uh, coming to the next one is actually one of my favorite sundays in a long time it's a uh, paul ryan sunday the return of cornell weeks now those who know know who cornell weeks is he's a fan favorite for most uh people who've been reading the phantom for a long time the original uh, cornell of the jungle patrol and uh, this is a great, great story and it's been reproduced really well. It's got everything, action, adventure, intrigue and that really nice bent of humor and all of it. And it's really, really well reproduced here. It's one of my favorite Sundays and uh, having both of them punched in this issue is like, it's, it's a really great issue in my opinion. This is a must have issue because it has two fantastic stories in one issue. Very unique and fantastic stories. Like two characters who fans you know who've been reading for a long time will really really enjoy it it's amazing go pick it up uh, which brings us to issue number 29 issue number 29 uh, the cover art is uh, by me and uh, i base this on my interpretation of the second story the croco island west which is a very important story which i will come to later when i uh, go inside and the supplement that you get is a card based on my art and as you can see since it's laminated the colors and its vibrancy is a little bit better than what the cover is the cover will probably get back its color vibrancy if it's laminated but it's not but it's but it's it's really well done it's come really well 
So, huh. so the very first story is free our front and it's again uh, Sunday by Jeff Weigel and uh, although personally I have never been a big fan of this story because these uh, these avarians and all like you know I, I've never been fan of the folk those those little men and those uh, the, those Romans who got lost in time those things it's very Tarzan like in my opinion like you know those Russ Manning Tarzan used to have those stories I, I kept, keep forgetting those names and things like that so but it's a nice story overall and it's very good it's been uh, reprinted recently I think also in Phantom and I think last this year or something but yeah so it's in color and it's well done which brings me to the second story involved which is a daily story by uh, Tony DePaul and Paul Ryan and this is a very important story because uh, it actually makes references of characters who were used in Phantomen and so it kind of makes those characters uh, in official you know continuity of the main strip so practically those events that happened in those Phantomen stories is now here because it's like especially you buried two murderers here a ghost a fitting place for them oh so you know this basically refers to uh, three stories i think uh, of the crocos which uh, is basically phantom stories and it's now referenced here so it's big and not just that this story is also important because it introduces a character uh captain savarna devi who is uh, an indian character who is the captain of the India Voyager 2 and uh, I don't want to spoil it for everyone but they will uh, realize with future publications how important this character really is and those who are reading the current daily story will know how important Savarna is and those who have read most of the stories since then will obviously know how important she is and how much she's grown as a character and for Indians you know they, you, uh, they can you know identify with her and all yeah, you could you should check it out this is a very important story and uh, so this is uh, something unique among all the books this one has a daily story along with the Sunday the rest of the books have Sundays only in them so yeah these are so that's what they are numbers 19 20 and 21 really great release and so yeah check them out thank you happy fantoming all right thank you so much guys uh, really value input coming from those uh countries from around the world who, who are on top of the comic books that we can't see all the time as always if um there are comic books being produced in your country and you're reading them and and you're not hearing about them on the podcast we'd love to hear from you um so particularly brazil but also germany we know there's books coming out now um, all over the world uh, we'd love to hear more international contributors to the podcast it'll go for for ages but that's okay because uh, it'll give us all something new to listen to and to listen about. So, as always, if you agree with, uh, or, or probably more likely to, to to jump on the socials and talk to us, if you disagree with something that you've said, we've said because people like to point out where we're wrong, and that's fine because um, we've all got different opinions. Um, jump on any of the socials in response to um, the posts we put up about the podcast, whether that's on Facebook at chroniclechamber.com or in the Phantom Collector group. Uh, we're on Twitter at chronicle underscore tweet. Instagram is at chronicle chamber. And of course, YouTube, if you do a search for chronicle chamber there, probably half of you are watching this right now on YouTube and you've already clicked the, the bell to get the notification that we are coming out and all the rest of it. Um, look, guys, it's it's been a bumper uh, couple of weeks for podcasts by the time we talked about news last week and comics today. Um, hopefully, it's some sort of a distraction for you guys as we all deal with whatever the version of the pandemic is for you right now around the world. Um, and as always, going into the fandom universe and arguing passionately about things that don't really matter. Um, hopefully, it's a bit of fun with a pH for everybody. So thank you very much, Jim. It's been an entertaining evening of uh, talking fandom with you. Yes, of course. Now, stay safe, everyone, and as always, happy phantom. Happy phantom, everybody. This man cannot die. The phantom, the ghost who walks. The phantom, enemies beware. The phantom's always there, but you won't find the phantom. He finds you.